Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Suki and Asla. Part 3. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Ailee had never felt this warm and safe in her life, and in her just awakened state, she wondered why. Groggily blinking her eyes, she glanced up and found the sleeping face of her childhood friend close to her own, his lips slightly parted as he lightly snored, his breath ruffling the top of her hair. She smiled as the previous day's events came to the forefront of her mind and snuggled closer to Naruto's son, as he now called himself and held him closer. Inwardly, she marveled at the warmth of his skin and firmness of his muscles, and the gentle but encompassing way he held her in his sleep. Naturally, her eyes were drawn to his lips, and she remembered the kiss she had laid on him the night before. I'm so confused, Tai Lee griped inwardly, playing with a strand of sun's sunny blonde hair. Just the day before, I learned that my best friend was still alive after 10 years of thinking that he was dead and hoping that he wasn't. And then, after he watched me perform and I invited him to sleep with me, and then I kissed him. She sighed in dismay and closed her eyes, sinking into the warmth his body provided, bound to figure it out later. Sun awoke with the sweet smell of Tai Lee in his nose, which wasn't marred at all by the slight salty tang from the sweat built up in her performance last night. He sighed into her soft brown hair, recalling the kiss she had laid on him. I really need to talk to her. Tai, he whispered, shaking her lightly. Wake up. Tai Lee shuffled a bit, grumbling. No don't want to worm. There's something important I need to tell you about. Sun insisted, shaking her more. Broggily, she lifted her head up and blinked slowly. Was it? She asked, yawning widely. Taking a deep breath, the blonde bender started. Okay while I was gone, I ended up Jatinjinjaj to a woman who will eventually take over her village. Tai Lee, now fully awake, sat up and stared down at him with wide gray eyes. You're getting married. She whispered, her voice sounding horrified. Yes. He said simply, sitting up. I wanted to tell you now before anything else happened between you see didn't want to mislead you or anything, Tai. I'm really sorry. The acrobat drew her knees up to her face, staring at the pink bedspread. But we. She finally asked, not meeting his eyes. Because I can do this. He replied, holding out his hand and bending an orb of water from her wash basin over to them. Sun froze the ball, before yellow flames sprang from his palms and engulfed the ice, evaporating it into a cloud of steam, which he banished from the tent with a stiff breeze. Yutai Lee murmured in a shocked whisper. You're the... Sun held out his hands placatingly. I'm not the avatar, Tai. I can bend multiple elements, but I'm not him. That's part of why I got engaged. Her father realized that, when people find out that I can do this, and possibly my children, they would do everything they can to get their hands on my power. So he engaged us, willingly, to ally myself with them. He sighed and ran a hand through his hair. So the acrobat started hesitantly. You'll end up being, like a lord or something. Sun nodded. Basically, yes. She bit her thumb and thought, her forefinger poking the tip of her nose. That means you could end up with wives from all over the nations. Tai Lee realized, sitting up straight. The blonde blanched. Er, well, yes, I guess. Actually, the princess I'm engaged to, she's been pushing me to find other women from other nations to take places with her, so that I don't end up surrounded by a bunch of girls who would willingly kill the others to get my favor and possibly my children. He shuddered, more than a little disturbed. It's really weird to think about, much less talk. Silence descended on the tent, both of the inhabitants lost in thought. Tai Lee eventually broke the silence. That means there's still a chance, though. Sun looked up from his contemplation, having been thinking of his princess almost ordering him to look for other women, and how weird and somewhat hurtful that was. A chance for what? He asked cluelessly. Tai Lee flushed a deep pink, uncharacteristically quiet while poking her fingers together. A chance for us. She murmured, her gray eyes sparkling as she glanced up at him. The blonde's eyebrows went up in shock. Us? He repeated in a dull monotone. Well, the acrobat pushed her hands together nervously. I've had a crush on you since we were kids, Naruto. I know that a I mean, we used to play being married, remember? I couldn't help but imagine that happening when we were older, or fantasizing a little. Son shook his head ruefully, smiling despite himself. I remember thought he had a crush on you too, Tai. I was so nervous whenever we played being married because I did the same thing. Though, those angry looks Azula and Mai would shoot at us was weird. I wonder why they would get angry. Tai Lee giggled to herself at the confused look on his face. He go by a different name and he may be older and more mature, but he's still Naruto. Anyway, you would have to ask the princess, Tai. He finished with a sigh. And to do that, you would have to come to the North Pole with us. The North Pole. She voiced her confusion. Sun nodded. The avatar, Ong, needs to learn how to waterbend. The only people who could teach him are in the North Pole. 
you would have to leave the circus behind, Tai. And your happy Harry couldn't take you away from that. Ai Li looked down at her knees. Too neat to think about this. And clean myself up. She added, sniffing herself and grimacing theatrically. It's a lot to take in, I know. Sun said sympathetically. I'll go get us some breakfast. I'll be in the big tent. She called after him as he donned his armor and left. Striding through the camp, Sun was treated to the sight of the various performers the morning after a show, most of them a mixture of tired and hungover. It was funny to see the active people from last night turned into the shuffling, moaning half-living bodies crying out for food and silence. After retrieving two bowls of rice porridge from the dining area, Sun was treated to the sight of the circus's owner, an older man with gray hair, talking to a Fire Nation soldier. Instantly, he ducked behind a nearby tent, their conversation drifting into his ears. While it is always a pleasure to host a member of the armed forces, I must ask what you are looking for. The owner, Yuan, said. The other man's voice was flat but very fast, as if he was thinking three words ahead when talking. I have heard rumors of a very talented acrobat who performs here at the circus, and I have reasons to believe that she could help in the war effort, and I need to see her immediately. Tai Li. Was the first thought that popped into Sun's head as he peeked around the tent to look upon the Fire Nation soldier. And he found that he was no ordinary soldier. No, the curled golden dragon and the Fire Nation symbol that shone in the early morning light denoted that, not only was that soldier not a soldier, he was a general. There was gold trim to his armor, and his dark brown hair was held in a top knot by a golden piece that denoted his rank. Highly? Yuan asked in disbelief. She's a magnificent acrobat, yes, but I don't see how a single girl could possibly help the war. That is for the Fire Lord and I to know. The general replied flatly. Yuan crossed his arms, frowning heavily. I need more than that, General Ran. Sun felt his blood run cold. Oh, spirits. He whispered, dropping the bowls of food to the ground and sprinting to the big tent. Pushing through the limp curtains that served as the opening, he came upon the side of Tai Li standing on her hands, which held a pair of chopsticks each that she was balancing on with a look of concentration. Briefly nonplussed, Sun shook it off. Tai Li. We need to leave, right now. The acrobat wavered on her chopsticks and fell gracefully, rolling to her feet. Naruto, I was trying to think. What then she noticed the panic look on his face. What is it? Someone from the Fire Nation is here, looking for you. He replied, checking to make sure no one was approaching. Ooh, is it Azul or Mai? That would be so nice of them. She cheered happily, before looking confused. But why should we leave? Sun gave her the most grave look he could muster. It's not Azul or Mai, Tai, it's a general from the army, he's here to take you. Before she could ask why, he continued. Have you ever wondered why you can jump as far and as high as you do, Tai Li? It's not something just anyone can learn through training, it's an inborn talent for manipulating air currents. You're an airbender. Tai Li gaped, her eyes wide. That's not possible. She whispered, looking down at her hands. That is not possible. It's more than possible, Tai, it's reality, and a Fire Nation general knows. He knows because he's an airbender himself. Sun stepped forward and took her arm gently but firmly. We need to go. I swear, I'll tell you everything you want to know, but we have to go, now. At that moment, General Ran entered the big tent, stopping as he saw the white-robed blonde standing next to Tai Li. The criminal is here as I suspected. He muttered to himself, though loudly enough that they heard. So you have come to the realization that the acrobat is an airbender yourself criminal. However I will not allow you to leave with her in your possession. And then he disappeared in a blur of motion. Sun knelt and snatched the chopsticks from the ground and hurled them behind himself as he jumped and rolled forward. Ran blurred back into view as the wooden sticks punched into the pillar of wood supporting the canvas around him, apparently missing him entirely. He attempted to to move again, but was pulled back as the chopsticks had stabbed through the bottom of his sleeves and the metal just above his shoulders, pinning him in place. The blonde picked Tylee up on his shoulder and dashed from the tent, heading towards the acrobat's place. Arriving, he set her down. Ty Lee, grab whatever you need and quickly, he won't be held back for long. Still in shock, the pink-loving girl quickly moved about her tent, grabbing what she valued most and stuffed it into a canvas bag, including a bag of coins that must have been the payments for her performances. After she was done, Ty Lee picked up the painting and slipped it down the front of her shirt. All right, I'm ready. She said, her voice quavering. He picked her up again and ran for the nearby forest, carrying her bag under his arm. A sharp whistle was his only warning as a blade of air zipped past his head, slicing a tree in front of them in half. Drop the airbender criminal. General Rand somehow managed to shout with his flat tone. No. Sun shouted, bending a ball of flame at the general. She's coming with me. The best idea would be to play as if he was kidnapping Tai Li, that way she wouldn't become a criminal. 
Bran blurred away, easily dodging the blast and dashed forward, drawing a pair of empty sword hilts from his waist. Blades of wind formed from the hilts, hissing angrily. Then die. He replied easily. His wind blade sparked as they met the golden metal of Sun's staff, as the blonde deflected them up and pointed the shortened staff at Rand's chest, extending it to its as full length, directly at the general's chest. Taken by surprise, the airbender slid back, gasping in pain as the armor over his chest was heavily dented. Sun, taking advantage of the moment, bent fire along the length of his staff and whirled it over his head, shaping the sunny yellow fire around him and Tai Li into an oscillating orb that hid them from sight. While the fire spun around them, he pulled the cloud pouch from his neck and opened it. Get on. He said tersely, his concentration on keeping the fire around them. Tai Li flopped down on top of the golden cumulus with bag under her stomach. Seeing that, Sun quickly shrunk and stored his staff before blowing a gust of wet air out his mouth at the fire, extinguishing the flames, but leaving behind a thick smoke cover. He dived on top of the cloud and held on as it sped off into the forest. Bran, having discarded the bent metal constricting his breathing, blew the smoke away, revealing only a circle of burnt grass, but no airbender or criminal. Thys is troubling. He muttered, frowning and storing his weapons away. We ee. Say what you will about Tai Li, but she doesn't get held down for long. Sun thought in amusement as the acrobat cheered, the wind in her face pulling her brown hair behind her like a streamer. After escaping from General Ran, they were now heading to Amashu to join up with the others, who should have been done with their community service shortly. Gathering herself, Tai Li shifted on the cloud and sat close to the blonde, holding onto his arm. Naruto, she called, drawing his attention. Who was that man? And why did he scare you? Sun sighed. That was General Ran of the Fire Nation Army. He's one of the most dangerous men in the world, and he was trying to take you. Once he realized that I was protecting you, he would have started targeting you, if not to get me off guard, then to make sure you couldn't leave alive. I can take care of myself, you know. She frowned at the implication that she would be a liability in combat. I created my own fighting style that works really well against benders. I wasn't trying to say that you can't protect yourself, Ty, he said apologetically, wrapping an arm around her shoulders. But you saw how fast he moved. We had to run. Plus, he's a general, he was bound to have an entourage of benders with him, or even his twin. Son shuddered, making the acrobat concerned. What's so scary about them? Tai Li asked. I'll wait until we meet up with the others, he shook his head, steering the cloud down into a copse of trees near Amashu's road. It's a long story, and they need to know. Here, take my robe, and we can get you some clothes that don't stand out as much. Tai Li frowned unhappily, but draped herself in the white cloth, which ended looking very cute, like a little girl wearing her much older mother's bathrobe. What's wrong with my clothes? I like pink. Nothing's wrong with pink, Sun was quick to reply, but your clothes are very Fire Nation, and the rest of world aren't their biggest fans. You can keep the pink, but we need to replace the dark red. The acrobat looked down, tugging at the dark red piece on her shoulders. But nothing else really goes with pink, she groused, before sticking her tongue out in disgust. You, imagine wearing green with pink, that would be so ugly. Sun chuckled, holding out his arm. Well, white seems to go with the color just fine. He pointed out. Tai Li held open his robe with one hand, checking the colors with one another. Hey, you're right. Maybe I can get some black to go with both of them, that would be cute. She took his arm, her bag slung over her shoulder. So, Naruto, you never told me why you're traveling with the Avatar. What's up with that? The blonde gave a long-suffering sigh. It's a long story, he said as they began to head down the road towards Amashu. Okay, so after I managed to escape Ozai, with a little help from uncle, I fell into a portal that led to the spirit world, where I met a bunch of spirits, including one who would become my master, a mischievous bastard monkey. He wouldn't stop laughing. I mean, yeah, looking back on it, it was funny, but I was picking gravel out of my teeth for weeks. I missed and hit the pillar behind him, cleanly breaking it, and then the building started falling down on top of us. We stopped fighting and ran for the exit, and we made it out safely. We were surrounded by the local police force, and we both got arrested. And that's how I became friends with him. And its tongue hit me, and I suddenly couldn't move. Then I threw glitter in his face and punched him, and I said, it matches your sparkling personality. And then I traveled to meet you on my cloud, and, well, you know the rest. Sun finished about an hour later. The two had entered Amashu and were making their way up the palace to see Pumi. Tai Li, her face red from constant laughter, leaned heavily on his shoulder as the guards made way for them. Wow, Naruto. You could walk down the street for some fire flakes and end up meeting a dragon, with the way your luck seems to go. Tell me about it, Sun replied, rolling his eyes. But, at the very least, I get to meet new and interesting people. You're about to meet four of them, actually. Her face falling, the acrobat squeezed his arm and looked down in worry. 
Do you think they like me? She asked, nervously playing with her long braid. They'll be suspicious of you, at least at first, he answered truthfully. But I know that, after a while, they'll start to trust and like you, like I do. Son glanced away and thought. Well, maybe not like I do, but they like you. It's hard not to enjoy your company, Ty. She hugged his arm closer to her and stood on the tip of her toes, lightly kissing his whiskered cheek. Thanks Naruto. I enjoy your company, too. They shared a light blush, before entering the arena where the guards had directed them. They found Ong fighting, i.e. running, from King Gumi, who was insanely muscled and spry for an old geezer, while Katara and Sokka watched from a balcony, both covered in quick-growing jade and sapphire crystals, respectively. Whoa, Tylee whispered. That old guy is buff. Yeah, Sun agreed dryly, watching Gumi stomp the ground and create a fissure that Ong nearly tumbled into. He used to kick my ass all up and down this arena like a pebble when I was learning how to earthbend. I don't see how this is community service, though. Taking glance at the crystal encased water siblings, the blonde noticed the portions of the colorful rock glowing, before growing even more. I can see how that is community service, in a roundabout way. Are they growing genomite for a candy shop they destroyed? Yumi did say something about property damage. Shrugging, he reached over and snapped a pair of crystals off of Sokka and stuck one in his mouth, offering the other to Ty Lee. Genomite. She took the crystal with a confused look. Um, Naruto. He hummed around the candy in his mouth. This is a rock. A pretty rock, but still a rock. Oh, Sun took his piece out of his mouth to speak clearly. It's genomite, also called creeping crystal. It's naturally growing rock candy. Ai Li blinked in surprise, looking down at the crystal as it grew slightly in reaction to her body heat. Huh. The Earth Kingdom is weird. Shrugging, she stuck it in her mouth and smiled. But sweet. Sun nodded in agreement. I don't really like sweets, but I like genomite. I think I picked up the habit from Gramps. It helps that it also has healthy minerals in it that help when recovering from fighting. Ai Li made an interested sort of gurgle around the candy in her mouth, and they settled down to watch the fight. It came to a head when Bumi used his powerful earthbending to rip the balcony on the opposite end of the arena from the wall and hurl it on. The young avatar, in a brilliant display of redirection, used his airbending enhanced speed to create a dusty tornado in the middle of the arena, managing to catch and return the balcony. Yumi, seeing his attack coming back, grunted and neatly cut the chunk of stone in half with a single swipe of his hand. Ong took a flying leap and landed before the king, his staff pointed at his opponent's chin. Despite being pinned, the mad king still smiled. A pebble bounced off of Ong's bald head, making him look up at the half of a balcony hovering above them, ready to drop and crush them both. Instead of dropping it, Yumi chuckled and snorted, negligently tossing the stone aside. Well done, young avatar. He congratulated, his usual crooked smile on his wrinkled face. You fight with much fire in your heart. He then fell backward on the floor, disappearing through the solid ground and leaving a hole shaped like himself. Ong jumped in surprise and looked to the balcony, where the king appeared out of the ground next to his friends. The young airbender spun his staff over his head and jumped, hovering over to join them. Sun snapped off another piece of genomite from Katara's formation and stuck it in his mouth. You've passed all my tests. Now, you must answer one question for me. Yumi spoke up, drawing his robes around him and looking once more like a crazy elderly frail mad king. What? Ong shouted in disbelief. That's not fair. You said you would free my friends if I passed all of your tests, and I did. Release them. The king shrugged carelessly. What's the point of any test if you don't learn something, eh? That is so like you, Gramps. Sun groused, crossing his arms. You always have to make everything more difficult. Sokka and Katara, their vision constrained by the genomite growing around their faces, had to shuffle in a circle. Sun. Their happy and relieved shouts were joined by Ong's voice. You came back. Katara said in relief. Sun arched an eyebrow at them, looking a little offended. Of course I did, I wasn't going to leave you here in it until you finished your community service, anyway. He turned to his old master with a question on his face. By the way, how is having Ong fight you community service, Gramps? Yumi smiled widely. Well, I am the king, I lead the community, so anything they do for me is technically community service. He giggled at the deadpan look on his old student's face. Now, young avatar, here is your question. What is my name? Ong's face went blank in surprise. What? From the looks of your friends, you only have a few minutes before that crystal covers them entirely. The Mad King noted, and as he made to leave, he turned back. And you can't ask my old student, either. They were escorted to the king's throne room by a pair of guards. Son, you know that crazy old man? Sokka asked as the crystal began to cover most of his head. He was my earthbending teacher, the blonde bender replied, answering the curious looks he was given by the gang. 
which, like all of my training, was incredibly difficult and more than a little bit crazy, but very worth it. I'm glad I'm not an earthbender, Ty Lee commented, skipping alongside Sun. Batara frowned minutely at the unknown girl walking so closely to her friend. Who's the girl, Sun? She asked carefully. There's a girl. Sokka asked, the genomite having grown over his eyes. I'm Ty Lee. The acrobat introduced with a wide smile, a look that both Ong and Katara found familiar somehow. Nice to meet you. Her eyes fell on Ong, and she unsubtly stepped around Sun, so that the blonde standing between them, taking his arm in hers. The young airbender looked confused at the cautious look she was shooting him, before shaking his head. Come on guys, I need some help with the king's name but I can't think of anything. What about Rocky? Sokka presented. You know, because of the rocks. A short silence fell, before his sister broke it. We're gonna keep trying, but that's a good backup. Sun couldn't tell if she was being serious or not. Rocky isn't all that common of name in the Earth Kingdom, actually. He remarked casually. There are a lot of Lees, though. There's two possibilities, Katara said encouragingly to Ong. Keep thinking. Maybe the challenges are some kind of clue. What did you have to do? The avatar looked up at the ceiling and thought, tapping his chin. Well, none of the tests had any direct solutions, and everything was different than what I expected. I had to think differently than I usually would he trailed off, a look realization dawning on his face. I know his name. At that moment, the group was led into the throne room, where the Mad King waited for them at the foot of the throne. Bong stepped forward with a serious visage. I solved the question the same way I solved the challenges. As you said a long time ago, I needed to open my brain to the possibilities. Yumi smiled widely and gave off his snorting laugh. Ong grinned and darted forward, wrapping the king in a tight hug. Yumi, you're a mad genius. The king hugged his old friend back, patting his bald head. It's good to see you Ong. You haven't changed a bit. Literally. He stepped back and shared a warm smile with his friend. You know, this is all very touching, Sokka voiced sarcastically, everything boo his mouth covered in sapphire crystal. But where our situation is very rocky right now. Yumi chuckled and pulled his fist back, making the crystal explode off of the water tribals. Easily catching a piece of it, he took a big bite out of it. Genomite is made out of rock candy, he revealed with a happy smile. Delicious. It is pretty tasty, Ty Lee interjected, a shard in her mouth. Sun, after gathering a few pieces to store and grow later, and a few more to eat, joined the gang as Bumi explained the future to Ong. You have much to learn, Ong, and a difficult task ahead of you. Only the Avatar can bring balance back to the world by defeating Fire Lord Ozai. You must master the elements, and when you confront him, I hope you think like a mad genius. Yumi chuckled crazily, before bowing respectfully to his old friend. Momo flew into the room and landed on Ong's head, chattering excitedly. And you'll need Momo, too. The Mad King added, before turning to Sunday. Now, my young student, who is the lovely young lady you have brought with you? Tai Lee stepped forward and bowed politely. My name is Tai Lee, your majesty. Her voice quivered with nerves as an airbender, an earthbender and two water tribals looked at her curiously. I'm one of Naruto's childhood friends. Sokka thought over her words childhood friend. He whispered to himself, before his eyes went wide with realization. She's Fire Nation. He shouted, drawing his boomerang. Ong and Katara both got into bending stances, and bumidant. He picked up a piece of genomite and flicked it at the Water Tribe warrior, knocking the metal angle from his hands. And with a stomp and clap, the airbender was sunk into the ground up to his shins, while small boots of rock formed over the waterbender's feet, and pieces of crystal pushed her hands together and locked her elbows in place. Having dissolved the standoff, the Mad King leaned on Ong's head casually. Go on. At Sokka's shout, Tai Lee had hid behind Sun, who stepped protectively in front of her and was giving his friends a stern glare. What's wrong with you, Sun? Sokka shouted again. Why did you bring the Fire Nation here? She could stab you in the back at any minute. The blonde cracked his knuckles, sounding similar to the rolling of thunder. Does the term childhood friend make no sense to you, Sokka? He asked rhetorically. I've been using it all chapter. I wouldn't have brought her if I didn't I know I can trust her, and I do, with my life. So calm down before you do something you regret. As Katara and Ong added their opinions in, Bumi stepped up and clapped his hands loudly. All of you, quiet down. He ordered sternly, his face serious. Perhaps you should explain your story from the beginning, son. Son nodded in agreement. All right, yesterday. Wait. The Mad King suddenly shouted, making them jump in surprise. If it's story time, I'm going to need a snack. He clapped his hands twice, drawing a guard from outside. You, fetch me a bowl of popcorn. A few minutes later, Yumi leaned on Ong's head again, but this time with a bowl of freshly popped kernels cradled in his arms. Okay, story time. Okay. The blonde started, shaking his head. 
Okay, yesterday I got a letter from Ty Lee, which is why I left you guys here. I noticed that the circus she was performing at was nearby, so I went to visit her. Long story short, we reunited, I decided to stay for her show, and I ended sleeping over after checking in on you guys. This morning, I went to get us some breakfast, and I overheard a conversation between the owner of the circus and general of the Fire Nation. Uo, Yumi Uid appreciatively around a mouthful of popcorn before offering the bowl to Ong. Popcorn? I'd like to get out of the floor, actually. The young airbender replied with a glare at his old friend. The Mad King arched an eyebrow. Is that no on the popcorn, then? Ong sighed and took a handful of the snack, Momo snagging an armful for himself. Beside the obvious, what's so bad about a Fire Nation general? Katara asked in confusion, lowering her candy-encased hands. I'll get to that later, Sun replied, but he wanted to find Tai Lee because he thought she could be an asset in the war effort. Sokka traded confused glances with his sister and Ong. Uh, why, exactly? He asked. Because he figured out that she's an airbender. The flat comment was greeted by complete silence except for the crunch of popcorn. And the general, general ran, he knew because he's also an airbender. Ong's jaw dropped even further, shock evident on his paling face. What? He screamed in surprise, echoing through the palace and possibly Amashu and the rest of the world. Nice dramatic timing. Yumi complimented with a crazy grin and thumbs up. Noting the pure shock on his old friend's face, he gave Sun a questioning look. You haven't told him yet. Ong snapped out of his stupor, glancing between master and student. Told me what? He asked in tremulous voice. Sun sighed heavily, running a hand through his blonde hair. I had hoped to avoid it entirely, actually, he admitted. Yumi gave him a disappointed look. I knew I would have to eventually, but can you blame me for not wanting to? It's not easy to hear. What's not easy to hear? Ong questioned, his tone making it obvious that he didn't want to hear it at all. Remember when we went to the Southern Air Temple? How I told you that some airbenders betrayed the others by leading the Fire Nation into their temples? The young airbender nodded shakily, his face pale. Well, what did you think happened to them? After they collaborated, they were spared and rewarded for helping. They were either set up as important political figures or merchants, like lords or governors, or they joined the armed forces and contributed to the war. The throne room was filled with an atmosphere of horror. Tai Lee was leaning heavily on Sun's back, her hands covering her mouth, silent tears running down her cheeks. Katara and Sokka shared a look of shock and dismay, and even Yumi was solemnly silent. That didn't compare to Ong, who looked as if his worldview had been shattered to pieces with the bleached skull of a loved one. Sun inhaled bracingly, licking his dry lips. Over a hundred years, they had children, and their children had children, who either never knew of their heritage, like Tai Lee, or they did and joined the war, like Ran and his twin brother, Run, who are part of a group of elite soldiers, known as the Ember Generals. The number varies a bit, but I know of five, and I know the names of three. Ran and Run, twin airbenders, and General Singh, a firebender. That's not possible Ong whispered brokenly, clasping his hands to his head, his eyes fixed on the floor. This can't be real. Unfortunately, it is very real, Ong. Yumi interjected with a sad visage. Why didn't you tell me, son? The avatar asked shakily. I knew how you would take it, Ong. Sun replied regretfully. I was in shock when I discovered it myself he can only imagine how you feel. Yuang whispered, why? Why didn't you tell me? The room darkened as his eyes and arrows began to shine in ethereal blue. The ground shattered around his feet, an orb of violently spinning wind swirling around him as he floated into the air, his fist clenched and a snarl on his face. Ong. Yumi shouted in worry, covering his face from the violent air whipping through the room. Stop. Sun, his orange scarf blowing in the wind, stepped forward as everyone else stepped back, the gold in his armor, and his hair beginning to glow with warm yellow light. His eyes met Ong's just as the blue was overtaken by yellow. His face became a stern, stone visage, his hand held out towards the avatar. Stop. He ordered in a layered, uneven tone. The palm of his hand shone as a sun etched itself into his flesh, glowing. The shine fraught against the blue of Ong's avatar state, piercing through the orb around him and meeting his forehead. Calm yourself before you do something you regret, avatar. Not Sun spoke as the avatar state faded, slowly dropping Ong to the ground. The glow faded from Sun, who blinked and stepped forward, wrapping the young airbender in a comforting embrace. I know I should have told you, Ong, he murmured sadly, I didn't want to cause you any more pain but I guess it was inevitable. Ong didn't reply, only burying his face in Sun's shoulder and beginning to sob, tightly hugging the blonde bender. Yumi joined in, quickly followed by Katara and Sokka. Ai Li stood apart from the group hug, feeling like a stranger intruding on something very private. That is, until Sun looked up from the hug and noticed her standing awkwardly. Giving her a soft smile, he held his hand out to her. 
The acrobat gulped and shuffled over, slowly taking the hand and being pulled into the warm embrace. Several minutes of comforting later, the group eventually broke up, wiping their faces. Think of it this way, Ong, Sun said comfortingly. You are the last true airbender but there are maybe hundreds of airbenders who don't know their heritage out there, just waiting to bring back the air nomads and there's one right here with us. He slid his arm around Tai Lee's shoulders, and the acrobat waved nervously. Hi. She greeted with a shy blush. I, uh, I'd like to learn how to be airbender, if that's alright. Ong, his eyes red, smiled wetly at her. I'll teach you Tai Lee. And Sun. But first he have challenge for you, Sun, and Bumi. Sun glanced at Tai Lee, before looking to the avatar. What is it? Tai Lee screamed in excitement, her arms wrapped around Sun's neck, his hands clamped around the lip of stone bin as he sat behind Ong, who was behind Bumi, as they rocketed down one of the long stone chutes that crisscrossed Amashu at breakneck speeds, cheering loudly as the speed blew air in their faces, making them lean back in the bin. The crash of wood meeting stone rang through Amashu, joined by an anguished wail. My cabbages. Sorry. Three days away from Amashu, supplies were starting to run a little low. So, while Sokka went foraging for some food to add to their dwindling stores, Ong settled down to teach Sun and Tai Lee some airbending. As anyone could have predicted, the Fire Nation-born acrobat was welcomed into the gang, though treated with thinly veiled suspicion and caution, something that definitely wore down on the cheerful girl. Before we start, Tai Lee held up her hands. You're not going to going to teach me anything like how to airbend the air out of someone's lungs, right? Or how to create a storm of wind blades to shred someone's skin off. Cause I wouldn't be okay with thought he mean, I'm no stranger to fighting, I invented my own style, but I don't really want to kill anyone in it unless I really have to, you know. Her words spilled out like a stream, uninterrupted as the look of shock on Ong's face grew. What? No. He suddenly shouted, making the acrobat draw back. Airbenders don't do that. Tai Lee peeked out from behind Naruto's back. Are you sure? Because that all we heard you do. Batara frowned at her. Where did you hear that? And why? She asked. Well, it's like, the kid's tales, you know Tai Lee explained, still clinging to Sun's back. Eat all your vegetables, or the ghost of a dead airbender will bend your breath out of your lungs while you're sleeping. Or, respect your elders, or a dead airbender will flay you alive with the wind. Parents tells those stories to their kids all the time. You know, the monsters under the bed kind of thing. Ong shot to his feet, clutching his staff angrily. Airbenders aren't monsters. He yelled, face twisted in anger. Yes, because shouting in her face is going to help your case. Sun chipped in sarcastically, feeling his old friend shiver against his back. He liked Ong, but shouting at sweet Tai Lee was a big no-no. Calm down, Ong, it's not like she would know if the stories were true or not. Until she met Ran, Tai Lee didn't know any airbenders still existed. But they they're demonizing my people. The last airbender cried, pointing in the general direction of the Fire Nation. They're turning us into monsters to scare little kids. Sun scowled slightly and clapped his hands, a loud, deep crack echoing from his palms. Of course they are, Ong. He interjected with clipped tones. Everyone knew the air nomads were peaceful for the most part. Every Fire Nation kid, once they heard the story about the airbenders, turned to their parents and asked, why? Of course they wouldn't say, we were scared that one of them is the Avatar, who could stop the Fire Lord's plans, and that's why we wiped out a peaceful people. No, they turned them into monsters, breath-stealing demons to assuage the nation's hidden guilt. It always happens in war, Ong. He glanced at a wide-eyed Katara. Doesn't your tribe do the same, Katara? Tell horror stories about the Fire Nation, how if they aren't good little boys and girls, Oz I will visit them in the night and burn them alive. He probed, already knowing the answer. The tribal nodded shakily, recalling the time she accidentally snapped the shaft of her father's favorite spear, while playing around with it. He had told her that if she wasn't careful with weaponry, the Fire Nation might attack in the middle of the night, and without his weapon, they would kill them all. It had haunted her nightmares for weeks, and even further after the incursion that took her mother away. Of course, after that, no one told those stories again. The wound was too fresh. The blonde bender ran a hand through his sunny hair, shaking his head. Ong, if you get angry at everything the Fire Nation has done to your people, you're going to be angry all the time. He stared into his eyes seriously. You're going to have to learn to deal with stuff like this. If we defeat oz I, we'll still need to bring balance back to the world. There's a whole nation who probably think like this. Ong slumped to the ground, cradling his bald head in his hands. The more I learn about the world, the more impossible it seems, he groaned into his arms. Sun sighed, reaching out to pat the airbender's shoulder. I'm not trying to discourage you, Ong, I'm just telling you the truth. Again, think of it as a way to show so many people wrong, show them what airbending is really meant for. He pointed at himself and his friend. Like you should be doing for us. Taking a bracing breath, Ong sat up and nodded. Right. 
All right. He exhaled heavily and clapped his hands together. So, airbending is the art of bending the air around us to protect ourselves and others from harm, but never to kill. The first step to learning how to airbend is meditation, like so. He sat on the ground, crossing his legs so that his ankles rested on the opposite knee and folded his hands together. Neither Sun nor Tai Li had much trouble copying his position. Now, close your eyes and feel the wind flow around you. The young airbender instructed, making sure his students did so before allowing his eyelids to slide shut. Feel how the breeze plays over your skin, gently pulling at your hair. Feel the emotion of the air itself, how happy, directionless and free it is. Then let the air flow through you, let it ride through your body, and let its feelings become your own. The tar watched in what was approaching Oz Ong's voice, though young and somewhat high-pitched, seemed to lull Naruto and Tai Li into meditative trances. They seemed to be lighter than before, as if they would begin to float away at any second. As you feel what the air feels, realize something. You aren't understanding the wind, you are the wind. You are free. You are directionless. You are the air itself. As he said those words, a visible current of wind formed around the avatar, picking up the dust and fallen leaves and spinning them around his still form like a localized tornado. And he wasn't the only one. Air spun around Naruto, gently ruffling his hair and his scarf, grasping at his cape and lifting it up, and one could almost see clouds form around him. Soft current surrounded Tai Li, playfully tugging at her braid and tickling her skin, drawing a small, happy smile from the girl. Before the waterbender's gaze, the air swirled around the three forcefully, lifting them into the air to hover about two inches from the ground. Eventually, the wind dispersed, gently setting them back on the ground. Tai Li was the first to speak, her voice low with an amazed sort of excitement. That was Samazing. She gushed breathlessly. I feel like something's been missing from my life and I just found it for the first time. Yeah, Sun agreed, his blue eyes wide. I read about it in the scrolls I could find, but it's definitely something else to actually experience. While they spoke, Ong had a wide grin that threatened to split his face in half. That's not even the best part. He said with a quiet exuberance, holding his hand out. This the first exercise. Hold your hand out and concentrate on the air. Don't try to control it, just gently guide it where you want it to go. He demonstrated his words by coaxing the air around his hand to swirl together into a sphere that spun in his palm. Guide it into your hand and direct it into a spin. Ong instructed gently. Sun had done so before, but was surprised by how easy and effortless it was to guide the air. Tai Li squealed happily as an orb of wind burst to life in her hand, merrily spinning an inch over her skin. Wow! She exclaimed, carefully bouncing to orb between her hands. It's so easy. The young avatar directed his ball to roll around his hands, up over his arms and shoulders, before letting it dissipate. And that's only the first exercise. He said happily. Soon, you could even do things like this. He hopped into the air and threw his arms down, creating a large furiously spinning ball of air that he balanced on with one foot, zooming around the small clearing that was their camp, whooping with joy. Sokka chose that moment to come back, carrying a pitifully empty looking sack. What's he so happy about? He asked, directing a questioning eyebrow at his sister. The Tara shrugged, a small smile on her face. He's just showing off for his new airbender friends. I think he's really happy he gets to teach about his way to new people. She answered watching Ong shoot around the camp. Huh. Her brother replied, not all that interested. Well, I've come back from my foraging. I brought all that I could find. Sokka upended the sack, spilling a few items on the ground. We've got some berries that might be poisonous, some round nuts and some oval nuts, and some rock-shaped nuts that might just be rocks. Momo dived on the small pile, grabbing one of the rock-shaped nuts, and banged it against a larger rock that was stuck in the ground, making a loud crash. The flying lemur looked between the nut and the rock, before hitting the ladder again, getting another loud crash. The group perked up. What was that? Sokka asked, looking around warily. Naruto looked up from the orb of air, letting it vanish. That sounds like someone earthbending. He muttered to himself, walking off into the forest to investigate. The rest of the team followed behind him, just as curious. They quickly walked through the forest, coming to a dried riverbed where they found a young man in his teens, going through the beginner stances of earthbending. The earthbender was making a large rock hover in place before him, straining from the effort. Peeking over a fallen trunk, Katara was the first to speak up. An actual earthbender. She said in wonder. Let's go meet him. Ong yelled excitedly, already climbing over the trunk. Being more cautious than them, Sokka shook his head. We don't know who that guy is, he could be dangerous. He reasoned, only to be ignored by his sister as she ran down the riverbed to meet the earthbender. Hello there, I'm Katara. She greeted him cheerfully with a small wave. What's your name? The earthbender turned to them with a wide-eyed, caught-with-your-pants-down look. He dropped the rock and backed away, before turning and sprinting away, quickly bending part of the dried riverbank behind him to block them. 
Well, I guess he thought you were the dangerous one, Katara. Sokka called teasingly. She drew up in a huff, turning her face away from her brother. I just wanted to say hi. She replied indignantly, crossing her arms. Haile tilted her head curiously at the pile of earth and dry riverbed. Witty run away? She asked Sun. The blonde bender shrugged. I'm guessing we're in or nearby one of the Fire Nation controlled Earth Kingdom village. They tend to separate the benders from the non-benders so they can control them easier. He replied, watching as Ong and Katara cheered about not having to eat nuts and berries for dinner, then running off to follow the retreating earthbender. The excitable acrobat frowned. Really? How do they do that? Her tone suggested she didn't want to know. Usually by separating them from their element. Sun answered. Firebenders end up in metal boxes, earthbenders are put somewhere with no earth, like a big boat or a platform of some sort. And waterbenders get their hands locked in molding clay. Though Tai Lee mumbled, looking up when she realized that they were alone in the forest. Did they really leave us here? Sun sighed and shook his head. Apparently. They shrugged at one another and began to follow the rest of the group, Tai Lee slipping her arm through Sun's and leaning on her childhood friend. Since we are going into town, we're going to need disguises. The acrobat among them fist pumped with her free hand. Yes. I love disguises. She cheered happily. Oh, what can I be? Maybe we can knock out a soldier and steal his armor, then I can pretend to tie you up and lead you into the village as a fake prisoner. Sun's eyebrow climbed up his head. Or, or, we can fashion a really long coat from these tree branches and plants, and I can sit on your shoulders, and we can pretend to be a really, really tall person. Tai Lee gushed girlishly. Or wait, we could find some black clothes and wear those to cover our entire bodies, because no one would be able to see us, then. Or I could disguise myself as one of those lady warriors you told me about. Both of Sun's eyebrows were nearly meeting his hairline, as he stopped to give his friend an extremely blank look. What? He asked quietly. Haile tilted her head to look at him, her wide gray eyes blinking innocently up at him. What do you think? Sun shook his head to clear his thoughts. Okay, in order. They would only be unconscious for a bit and we're just going to find the others. And the armor wouldn't fit, either. Second, a giant person covered in a coat of leafy branches would definitely be more suspicious than just us as we are now. Same with the black clothes, as it is the middle of the day. Lastly, the Kayashi warriors aren't all that well known, but they'd stand out. Also, we don't have the materials. Oh, the excitable acrobat groaned, pouting in dismay. Duckling, the blonde bender withdrew his arm from hers and stopped, bending down to pick a handful of bright red berries hanging from a branch, surrounded by green, sharp leaves. I was thinking something a little less drastic. He said, bending a stream of water from the bare trickle in the former riverbed into an orb in his hand. Are you going to eat those? Tai Lee asked cautiously, shooting the vibrant fruits an odd look. That would be a bad idea, Sun replied with a small smile. These berries are poisonous, but they make a pretty good dye. He crushed the berries in his hand, dropped them into the spinning orb of water, the liquid darkening to a deep red. After grabbing and crushing a few more, he pulled his cape off and hung it on a branch. Tai Lee watched with her head tilted curiously as Naruto bent the mix over his cloak, changing the off-white color to a light red, which he dried with a quick blast of airbending, pulling it down, the blonde swung it over Tai Lee's shoulders, draping the cape about her like a cloak. The acrobat was a lot less broad in the shoulder than Sun, so the fabric hung around her like a curtain. There. Sun said in satisfaction. Now you look like any other traveler. And she did, for the most part. No one would give her any second looks. Tai Lee spun, making the cape swish around her. This is really comfortable. She noted, rubbing the fabric between her fingers. It's really soft. Sun smiled at her excited face, pulling on the long shirt and pants he wore in the South Pole. He pulled his scarf off and folded it, before pulling it over his hair and tying it back, hiding his blonde locks from view. Now I just need to hide my whiskers and we'll be good. He muttered to himself. Oh. Ty Lee spoke up, hopping in place. I've got just the thing. She felt about herself under the cloak, finally pulling something from her pocket with a triumphant, aha. Is that my cube? Naruto asked with some trepidation, looking over the case that was made from a medium-sized clam with a light pink shell, held shut with a small silver clasp. That was one of the things you grabbed when we ran away. Yup. She replied cheerfully, waving the small kid about. You never know when you'll need to touch up. Now come here and let me see your face. Taking a bracing breath, Sun stepped up to Tai Lee and leaned down as she pulled a small brush from the case and cracked it open, dabbing at some of the powder within. They gulped quietly as their faces were inches away, and he couldn't decide what was more eye-catching, Tai Lee's happily glittering gray eyes, her round cheeks or her full lips, which she would occasionally bite the lower one in thought. He decided that her whole face was the most eye-catching, especially with the way her cheeks were going pink and the way her eyes stared into his. 
She really had grown from a cute little girl into a beautiful woman. He started upon realizing that Ty Lee was staring directly at him, blushing under his gaze, and he couldn't help but do the same. Well, he coughed awkwardly. We should catch up with the others. Yeah, she mumbled, quietly closing the small kit and storing it away. We shall definitely do that. Son cleared his throat. Ahem. So. He was interrupted by Ty Lee jumping on him, locking her legs around his waist and her arms around his neck, seizing the back of his head and pulling him forward, mashing her lips against his in a passionate kiss. Sun responded by wrapping his arms around her, both in surprise and to support her as she pressed against him, slipping her tongue through his lips to tangle with his. After a few seconds, Ty Lee pulled away a little bit, smiling and rubbing her nose against his. Okay Sun whispered, his eyes wide in shock. Ty. She drew back and stared seriously into his eyes. I thought you were dead for 10 years. I'm not going to hold myself back from showing you how much I love you, whatever you think your fiancé will say. She stated firmly. I feel even more free than I did when I ran away and joined the circus, and it's because of you. Sighing, Naruto leaned his forehead against hers, closing his eyes. I know what you mean, Tai. I just don't want you to get hurt later on. He muttered, hugging her to him. She giggled quietly, rubbing her cheek against his. You won't hurt me, will you? I'll do my best not to. He promised. The future was always in motion after all. Then it's not a problem. Ty Lee replied, ending the conversation she pecked his lips once more before pulling away, her eyes landing on his cheek. Whoops, I accidentally rubbed some of your disguise off. She giggled, retrieving the kid again. After touching up Sun's face, the two of them followed the trail left by the others, finding themselves in a small, walled-off village that had various Fire Nation troops patrolling the streets. The soldiers leered at the villagers, and they in turn shrank back, as if wishing to disappear into the ground or the walls. Ty Lee gripped Sun's hand tightly, her face stony and blank. They caught sight of the hem of Sokka's blue clothing as he disappeared into a store, and they quickly caught up with the others, slipping inside just as Ong said, no she doesn't. We saw you worth bending. The harried looking woman hurriedly shut the door and dropped the blinds, before turning to the teen who was obviously her son. They saw you doing what? The teen drew back, before pointing a finger at them. They're obviously crazy, mom, I mean look at how they're dressed. He denied. Sun narrowed his eyes at the panicked weary look both Earth Kingdom villagers sported, furtively shooting looks at the closed windows. I was right. He sighed quietly, crossing his arms over his chest. You know how dangerous that is, Haru. The woman barked, worry and fear etched on her face. You know what would happen if they caught you worth bending. The sudden pair of hard knocks on the door only heightened the tension, and that was taken even further when Sokka quietly announced, Fire Nation. He turned to the gang and ordered, act natural. As Haru's mom went to the door, Sokka grabbed a fruit and held it out speculatively as Haru looked down at it, a hand on his chin in thought. Katara grabbed a bowl of berries and mimed being caught mid-snack, and Ong leaned on a barrel with a very wide, cheesy smile. Sun and Tai Lee traded disconcerted looks, which was ironically enough the only natural act, giving the weird people in weird poses weird looks as they slowly backed away. The door was opened, allowing a Fire Nation soldier bearing the leader of the company's crest on his helm, a smirk on his face that quickly gave to confusion, an eyebrow lifting in confusion as he took in the poses the others in the room had taken. Ong fell over as the lid of the barrel he was leaning on gave way, splashing water and hitting his chin on the lip. The captain blinked, before turning as Haru's mother spoke up. What do you want? We already paid up this week. She used the mom tone, which usually broke no argument. He smirked again. The tax just doubled. He said, obviously lying as he held up a hand, forming a crackling ball of fire. We wouldn't want an accident, would we? The older woman's face faded from defiance to resigned acceptance, and Son clenched his fist, trying to hold himself back from attacking. Tai Lee, her face blank once more, gripped his arm to stop him and herself from acting. Fire is so hard to control, sometimes. The soldier added, the ball of flame flaring for emphasis. Eru's mother simply sighed quietly, walking around the store's counter and retrieving a small wooden chest. She opened it up and scooped a few pitiful silver and copper coins, handing them over to Soldier, who smirked in satisfaction, picking a few coins away and dropping them on the floor. You can keep the copper ones. He taunted, tucking the silver currency away into his pocket and leaving with the other soldiers. Sighing once more, the woman picked the coins up, the atmosphere miserable. Nice guy, Sokka spoke up sarcastically. How long have they been here? Five years. The older woman said resignedly. The Fire Lord uses our coal mines to fuel his ships. Eru scoffed, his face twisting in anger. They're thugs. He spat. They steal from us, they steal from everyone. And no one does anything because they're all cowards. His mother shot him a warning look. Don't say that, Haru. She ordered firmly. But he's an earthbender. 
Katara insisted, though quietly. He can help. How could he help, Katara? Sun asked suddenly, his face stern. From what I saw, he's a beginner, if that. Even if we helped, there's an entire company occupying this town. We can't face that by ourselves without causing a lot of damage. The soldiers take away any earthbenders they find. Haru's mother said sadly. They took away Haru's fathari can't lose him, too. Earthbending has brought nothing but misery to our family. The solemn silence fell over the shop, each occupant lost in their thoughts. So, you said something about creating a fighting style. Sun asked as they set up their bedrolls in the barn near Haru's house, his mother graciously letting them use it for the night. Ailee perked up from her dark thoughts, a bright smile lighting up her face. That's right. I call it Kai blocking. She took a loose fighting stance, her hands curled into fists. Ong flopped onto a bale of hay next to them, cupping his chin and looking curiously at the acrobat. Why do you call it Kai blocking? She blinked blankly. Because it can block Kai. She replied slowly, giving the avatar a strange look. I've never heard of that before, Sun interjected, giving his friend an impressed look. And you created it yourself. Ailee blushed, nodding happily. Yup. I mean, I studied a few medical scrolls so I could find the Kai systems in people, and a few acupuncture scrolls, and I used that knowledge to create Kai blocking. She explained quickly, throwing a few punches for emphasis. Eh, hey, I don't really believe that. Sokka stated, lazily reclining on Appa's tail with a piece of hay in his lips. You don't really seem like the type to make something like that. The acrobat turned a narrow-eyed glare on the warrior. What do you mean by that? She asked, her tone threatening. Sokka, completely ignoring the change in atmosphere, casually added fuel to the fire. Well, your girl, all giggly and pink. I just don't see it. He finished with a shrug. Ailee's smile became just a little bit menacing. It works on non-benders, too. She added. Stand up, and I'll show you. Sun watched with no little amusement as Sokka sighed, like standing up was some great effort that could be better spent lying around or eating. He leaned against a post, looking bored. Without warning, Tai Li darted forward, jabbing Sokka in the shoulder with two fingers, causing his arm to fall limp and for him to collapse against the wooden post. Then, she lightly kicked the inside of his knee, which led to Sokka falling to the ground, two of his limbs numb. Believe me now? She asked sweetly. Sokka nodded frantically, trying to wiggle away from the smiling airbender. Yes, I believe you now. Can you unkai block me, please? Tai Li shrugged, still smiling. I can't do that, sorry. She answered, not sounding sorry at all. She cartwheeled over to Sun, who was finishing setting up his bag. He looked up at her, a smirk playing on his lips. I won't lie, Ty, that is both really impressive and really scary at the same time. He said truthfully. Oh, you really think so? She turned away, cheeks flushed at the compliment. Very. Sun replied simply. Ty Lee gave him a tight hug, leaning her head on his shoulder. Thanks. Ong poked Sokka in the leg, interestedly watching the Water Tribe warrior's reaction. Did you feel that? He asked, jiggling Sokka's arm with his staff. No. And stop doing that. Sokka replied, using his right arm to sit himself against Appa. As dinner, which consisted of the remainder of their supplies from Amashu and few edible herbs that Sun had foraged for, cooked, Tai Li sighed looking up at the full moon with a sad face. What's wrong? Sun asked, setting the ladle aside and taking a seat next to her. Are you missing the circus? She shook her head, her long braid whipping around. Now, yes, but I'm also thinking about Azula and Mai. Tai Lee sighed, leaning against her childhood friend. They know you're alive, but I'm the only one here with you. I feel bad for leaving them out. Aruto wrapped his arm around her, pulling her close. I don't like it either. Next time we're near a Fire Nation colony, we'll write a letter and commission a messenger hawk and send it to them. How does that sound? She frowned lightly. Why we can't do that now? She asked unhappily. Well, this village is just occupied, there aren't any Fire Nation colonials here, so any messenger hawks are for military use only. Oh. The Tara, flushed with success, paused as she approached the barn, seeing the two old friends cuddling in the moonlight. It was a strange dichotomy for the waterbender. On one hand, Tai Li was born and raised in the Fire Nation, and Katara's childhood demanded that she be treated as an enemy. On the other hand, she genuinely liked the bubbly acrobat and found her friendly and helpful, if a little tiring. And she was an old friend of Sun's, which definitely made the blonde bender happy, as well as a new airbender for Ankh to teach, which made the young avatar very happy. But, on an entirely different hand, one that seemed to have grown inside of her ribsage and squeeze painfully at her heart whenever she saw them being affectionate, Katara really wished Sun had never gotten that letter from Tai Lee. Biting back her feelings, Katara approached them with a smile. Hey guys. She greeted, stepping into the barn. You'll never guess what happened. 
Sun served the traveler's stew out to everyone as she regaled them with a tale of how, during the walk she took with Haru after commiserating about how one of their parents had been taken by the Fire Nation, they came across an old man trapped under a boulder as the entrance to an old coal mine collapsed on top of him, with Haru bravely using his earthbending to save the man from a slow, crushing death. The blonde refrained from pointing out that, if Haru's mother's point of view of earthbending being a curse was widespread, which it probably was, then Haru was probably in danger. However, knowing Katara, her reaction to that news would probably end up with all of them either being caught by the Fire Nation or, more realistically, having to fight them off and run, leaving the town in even more trouble. So, Sun held back and ate his food and went to bed, quietly preparing for the next day. Sure enough, after they woke up, Katara came stumbling back into the barn, grabbing at her hair in anguish. They took him. She shouted, eyes wide with worry. The cool. Tylee asked groggily, rubbing at her eyes. Peru. Katara answered tearily. The old man turned him into the Fire Nation, and they came last night and took him away. Sokka, genuinely concerned, put an arm around his sister's shoulders and held her hand. If they took him last night, then there's no way for us to track him. He said regretfully. There's nothing we can do, Katara. But we have to do something. Katara insisted, dashing her tears away. It's all my fault, I pressured him into earthbending. She stopped, snapping her fingers in realization. That's it. Hailee, still half awake, frowned at the waterbender. Can you stop shouting? She asked grumpily, yawning widely. Some of us are still getting used to waking up at dawn. Ignoring her, Katara finished her thought. We don't have to track him, the Fire Nation will bring me right to him. Ong traded confused glances with Sokka and Sun. Why would they do that, exactly? He asked carefully. Because they'll arrest me for earthbending. She said firmly, looking determined. Sokka started speaking, before stopping and clearing his throat. Uh, Katara. You know you're more the magic water stuff, not the magic rock stuff, right? Katara whirled around, pointing outside. I have an idea she proceeded to explain that there were air vents all around town, which, if they rolled a boulder over and had Ong and Tylee airbend into an adjacent vent, they could mimic the look of earthbending, thus getting her arrested. Sokka cleared his throat, pointing at Sun. Katara, you know Sun. She arched an eyebrow at him. What? You realize that I'm an earthbender, right? Sun spoke up, getting Katara's attention. It would make more sense for someone who can actually earthbend be arrested for earthbending. But Katara stuttered, recognizing his logic. But it's my fault he got arrested in the first place. I should be the one to make it right. Ong nodded in agreement, but the blonde bender was quick to shoot it down. Except that you're not a firebender or an airbender, and that the prison, while likely on the water. I'm a waterbender. She interjected, crossing her arms over her chest in irritation. Sun glared at her from under his blonde bangs. I've taught you a bit, but not enough to be safe in a prison full of experienced firebenders, Katara. It makes the most sense for me to go, not you. He finished. Besides, I'm the leader of this little group. Wait, I thought I was the leader. Ong spoke up, frowning. I am the avatar. And I'm your guide, the blonde replied, how could I guide you if I'm not leading? The avatar ceded to his logic, but looked put out by it. I agree with Sun, Sokka added with some finality. Not just because I don't want to see my sister get hauled off by a bunch of ruthless firebenders, though that is a big part. But because Sun is the most experienced out of us. He can handle himself. Sun nodded to the water tribe warrior. Exactly. Thanks. He stood and stretched. Besides, it's not like I'll be unarmed. I'll still have my bending, and my staff. He pulled the shrunken form of his staff from his pocket and shrank it further, to the size of a needle. Then, he put it in his mouth and quickly took it back out and spat, rinsing it in water. It tastes like my hands. The patrol is coming. Ong called from the top of a nearby building. Take your places. Sun, now bereft of his armor and in his traveling clothes, turned to Sokka. All right, now remember to follow us at a distance. I don't know how long it'll take to free the earthbenders, but give me until midnight. Sokka nodded, but Katara huffed. I still think it should be me. She grumbled sullenly. Haile suddenly jumped on Naruto, hugging him tightly. Be safe, okay? She whispered sadly and come back. Sun gently patted her back, setting her down. I will, Tai. The two girls stepped out of view as a patrol of three firebenders came around a corner. Sokka scowled at Sun and pointed angrily at his scarf. Who wears orange, anyway? He said sneeringly. It's garish and too bright. Sun's eye twitched. I'll crush you. He roared, shaking the earth with a stomp that sent the warrior to the ground, bending a chunk of earth up from the ground and holding it over Sokka. Orange is the best color in the world. The Fire Nation soldiers saw this very clearly, running forward and pointing their spears at Sun. Stop, Earthbender. You're under arrest. 
As Sun turned to face them, Sokka pushed himself up and leapt at the blonde, wrapping his arms around his neck. I'll hold him. Sun dropped his arms, letting the rock fall with gritted teeth. You're going to pay for that orange crack, Sokka. He whispered as the soldiers clapped him in irons and began to lead him away. Ong and the others joined Sokka as they watched Sun be taken away. He knows I was joking about that, right? He asked worriedly, only for Ong to straighten his orange robes with an angry huff and walk off with his nose in the air. I was just joking. Sun stood with a line of earthbenders on the prison, his clothes having been switched for more appropriate prison garb, as the warden strutted in front of them, his hands folded behind his back and wearing a polite visage. Earthbenders, he began politely, it is my pleasure to welcome you to my modest shipyard. I'm not like other wardens, I like to think of you as honored guests, not prisoners, and I hope you'll think of me as a humble caring host. If you simply abide by my rules, you will find. He was interrupted by an earthbender and a line suddenly hacking loudly after breathing in a cloud of acrid smoke. The warden spun around, shooting a ball of fire at the prisoner's feet, making him jump back in panic. What kind of guest dishonors his host by interrupting? He shouted, before pointing at two nearby guards. You and you, take this miserable cretin down below. A weak and solitary ought to improve his manners. Sun watched helplessly as the man was led away, kicking and struggling. The warden sighed, straightening his armor. As I was saying, he said with a humph. Treat me with the same courtesy I give you, and we will get along famously. He turned to leave, before stopping and looking back at them over his shoulder. Oh, and if you have noticed, this rig is made entirely out of metal, and you are miles away from any rock or earth. So, if you wish to employ that barbaric gesturing you call a bending art, you'll find that it is quite impossible. The warden waved his hand dismissively, taking his leave, as the prisoners were led away to their new home. Sun had the irons around his wrists unlatched and was pushed through a small door, out into the living area. It was wide open, and that was really the only thing good that could be said about it. Small tents had been pitched, but the fabric was threadbare and thin, and there was an aura of hopelessness that permeated the whole place. Stepping in, Sun quickly found Haru, who was more than a little surprised to see him. You're one of those guys who was with Katara-san, right? That's me. He replied with a small smile. She felt bad about you getting arrested, so I decided to come and help you guys break out of here. You felt bad, so you got yourself arrested. Haru chuckled, shaking his head. That takes guts. Come on, there's someone I want you to meet. The younger teen led Sun to a group of prisoners who were eating some kind of food out of wooden bowls, stopping at the last, a large man with long beard and a weary face. Sun, this is my father Tyro. Sun nodded to the man. Nice to meet you. So, he went straight to his whole point of being there. What's your escape plan? Escape plan? Tyro repeated with some incredulity. There is no escape plan. The only thing we can do is survive and hope that this war ends soon so that we can all go home and forget this ever happened. Sun stared at the older man with shock on his face. What? He said lowly. That's it. You're just going to wait. You're not going to fight back, not even to see your wife again. That's not what I said. Tyro growled, peering at the blonde over the edge of his bowl. Look, I admire your courage and youth, but there are lives at stake, here, and not just ours, either. Then that's all the more reason to fight. Sun yelled, slamming his fist into the metal ground, startling the men and women around. If you won't fight to save yourselves, at least do so for your loved ones. Do you have no spine? Eru started forward, his father speaking up. I don't like your tone. He muttered threateningly. Sun glowered at him, his eyes like chips of ice. I don't care. He spoke through gritted teeth, before standing and walking to an open area. Clapping his hands to get their attention, he shouted, Earthbenders. You sit here on this fake island, heads bowed and spirits shackled, but you are not dead. Well, your family suffer on the mainland, you suffer here, in silence. And why? The warden, drawn by the commotion, watched with a smirk as the blonde appealed to the crowd, though they appeared to be looking at him with fear and trepidation than anything else. Because you think you are powerless. Sun continued. You may not be able to bend, but there is more to all of you than just bending. You still have arms. You still have lives. The fight is not over, not so long as one of us breathes. This fight can still be won, but you have to get back up. You've been knocked down, but your fate is still in your hands. He raised his arms, spreading them before the masses. Who will join me? Who still has the will to fight? He called, watching with dawning disappointment as Haru tried to step forward, but was pulled back by his father. The other earthbenders shrank back, and the warden shook his head, laughing. Turning away, he began to walk off, satisfied that the spirits of his prisoners was still broken. Sun viewed the fearful faces, an empty feeling welling up inside of him. No one. He shook his head in disgust. I see, now. You've been whipped. Beaten down. Broken. So much for the famed unbreakable will of the Earth Kingdom. 
The blonde scoffed, pointing at smokestack that was spewing black smoke into the sky. Do you see that? What exactly do you think the Fire Nation is burning, wood? Coal. They store it under here. The key to your freedom is right beneath your feet. He stomped, throwing his arms out, to seemingly no effect. Then, the platform underneath them shook, a deep rumbling echoing from down below, before piles of coal spilled out of vents around Sun, piling up. He stepped on top of the newly made hill, scooping up a handful of coal. Do you see this? This is the instrument of your freedom. Take up your skills and free yourselves. He called, the warden peering down at him from above. I ask once again, who will join me? Who wishes to take their fate back? There was silence. Sun scowled, crushing the lumps in his hand to dust. Where the hell is your pride? He barked angrily. Not just as earthbenders, but as men and women. If you can still be called that. You're more like whip dogs, cowering before their owner in fear. That is exactly what they are. The warden called down, a smug smirk on his face. They have no pride anymore, you foolish boy. I've made sure of that. Did you really think some inspirational speech and some coal would be all it took? Sun sighed explosively, glancing at the fearful earthbenders over his shoulder. I had hoped. He muttered. Eru broke away from his father's grip and sprinted forward, scrambling up the pile to stand next to Sunday. Sun is right. Iro stepped forward, urgently waving at his son. Haru. Get down from there right now. No. Haru denied, shaking his head fiercely. I will fight, even if you want. Because I'm tired of having to hide what I am, to be ashamed of what I can do with my gift, to suffer because of men like him. He shouted, pointing an accusing finger at the warden. Join us. Fight back. The warden laughed uproariously, as if he had just been told a very funny joke. It was a good effort, boys, truly. But this farce has gone on long enough. He motioned to the firebenders dropping from above to surround the two. Kill them. As the benders began to create fire, Sun glanced at the other earthbenders, shaking his head in disappointment. Well, I tried. He muttered, reaching up and pulling a gold needle out of his mouth. Haru, duck. The younger teen dropped to the ground as Sun spun the suddenly overlong staff over his head, knocking the firebenders to the ground, whirling around to fire a wall of air at the charging guards. Eru bent coal into the air, firing it at the guards attacking them, who deflected most of it with precise blasts of fire. A wall of coal suddenly rose behind him, the warden's sneak attack splashing harmlessly against it. Haru turned and spotted his father, his face fierce and determined. For the Earth Kingdom. He roared, slamming his palms into the ground, bending a wave of coal at the forces pouring from the main body of the prison. Attack. The melee began as the earthbenders, their spirits aroused once more, attacked their captors with boulders of coal and a desire for revenge. The firebenders fought back, littering the deck with heaps and piles of burning coal. Appa flew overhead, dropping Avong and the others. Katara summoned a wave of water from the ocean around them, throwing it at the firebenders attacking them. Haile flipped through the ruckus, jabbing and kicking those who came near, finding themselves unable to move and falling to the ground, numb. She dodged under a tongue of flame, cartwheeling behind her attack and lightly punching the side of his neck and spine, causing him to tumble forward, before backflipping over a ball of fire, facing the firebender who sent it at her. Only for the man to pitch forward, flying over her head and splashing into the ocean. Sun smiled at her, before pointing behind her. Ty Lee spun, her braid slapping the firebender behind her in the face, stunning him and allowing her to blast him off the side with her airbending. Head for the ships. Tyro commanded, hurling a small boulder at the warden. Ong spun his staff, creating a tornado that swept across the deck, picking up both firebenders and coal, battering the former with the latter, the earthbenders hurling their defeated enemies into the twister. Sun picked up a firebender by his face and hurled him into the whirlwind as it burst, throwing bodies and black rocks into the air to land heavily on the deck. Iro and another pair of earthbenders gathered the coal and the guards into one large messy ball, letting it hover over the side. No, you can't do this. I can't swim. The warden called fearfully. Iro grinned fiercely, baring his teeth. Don't worry, I heard that coward's float. He called, dumping the gathered mass overboard. Hours later, Sun stood at the prow of a Fire Nation ship that had been stolen by the free earthbenders and was now heading towards the mainland. He spied Katara talking animatedly with Haru as Tyro approached. You were right. The older man said. Our pride was broken. But you and my son showed me that as long as I still breathe, I can still fight. It is when we lose the will to fight, even for the ones we love, that we truly stop being human. Sun said wisely, looking up at the full moon overhead. I guess some of my teacher's wisdom rubbed off on me. He thought with a small smile. Wise words. And while I don't appreciate how you said what you did, my family owes you a great debt. Tyro stated. And after today, we will take back my village and the others from the Fire Nation. We will make them regret stepping foot on our land. Sun turned to face the older man, bowing slightly. 
I wish you the best of luck. He said, sticking out his hand. Hiro chuckled, shaking his hand strongly. I get the feeling you will need it more than I, seeing as you are traveling with the Avatar. He said knowingly, tilting his head at Ong. True enough. Sun agreed with a light laugh. He left the prow, approaching Appa, who was sitting on the deck as Ong and the others prepared to take off. Tai Li was looking rather frazzled, searching through the saddlebags with a panicked look on her face. What's wrong, Tai? He asked. My hair. She cried unhappily, tugging on her messy braid, which appeared to be missing one of the bindings. I lost one of the bindings. Sun hugged her, trying to soothe her. It's alright, Tai. I'll get you another one when we stop next. She sniffled, rubbing her face on his shoulder. But I like that one. She murmured unhappily. They climbed into the saddle and settled in as Ong flicked the reins, and Appa took off to continue their journey. Back on the rig, someone knelt on the ground, brushing away a bit of coal, exposing a burnt orange binding that they picked up. Zuko held the small hairpiece up to the light, his face twisted in confusion. Then, realization struck, and his eyes went wide. Sokka was a banana. Well, he dreamed of being a banana. Anyway, hanging from from a branch by his lonesome, gently rocking in the breeze. All the other bananas in the bunch had been picked when they were creamy yellow, but Sokka the banana had not been picked, and that was because he was blue. He was Sokka the blue banana. It wasn't as if Sokka, who was a blue banana, minded all that much, after all, people ate the bananas they picked, and if they didn't pick him, he wouldn't be eaten. It was flawless logic, as far as he was concerned. After a while, Sokka began to wonder, which was strange, because most bananas didn't wonder or even think, but he was special. And blue. Most of his dreams, when they included food, featured him eating them. A part of him wondered how that could be, after all bananas, even blue ones, didn't have mouths, but it was unimportant. There was one dream where a legion of blubbered seal jerky soldiers stormed his sleeping bag and attempted to strangle him for his merciless eating of their brethren, but that always ended with him heroically defeating his delicious enemy by heroically sacrificing his waistline to eat the entire legion of jerky soldiers and waking up to find that he had been chewing on his pillow in his sleep. Even though blue bananas really didn't interact much with jerky. Or seals. Or pillows. Before Sokka the blue banana could follow this train of thought, a harsh breeze rocked the branch he was hanging on, catapulting him into the waking world. Sokka the water tribe warrior woke up wondering why he was hanging in his sleeping bag, before panic took over and yelled out in surprise. What the hell's going on? He screamed, trying to scrabble out of his bag, only to freeze when it rocked in the wind. He was caught in a branch or something on the side of a cliff, unable to see the ground through the thick swirling mist surrounding him. Hanging out, Sokka. A familiar voice asked. Looking up as best as he could in the situation, Sokka found Sun looking down at him with a smirk. Sun. He called hopefully. Help me. Sun put his hand to his chin and thought. Well, I could do that, he mused, but my scarf is so garishly bright and orange that I might be blinded and accidentally miss. Better to not try, I'd say. What? Sokka called in surprise. You can see me just fine. Pull me up before I plummet to my death, son. The blonde bender shrugged. Nah, I'm good. I'm just going to stand here with my orange scarf that you insulted and just watch. Should be fun. He grinned scarily at the hanging tribal, fingering his neckwear. But if you, say, apologize and say that orange is the best color in the world, I might help you up. Barely pausing for a thought, Sokka quickly shouted, I'm sorry. Orange is the best color in the world. Sun tilted his head in thought. That didn't seem sincere enough. He said, before shrugging. Oh well. Bye Sokka, have a nice trip. He waved as he turned to walk away. Orange is the best color in the world. It's better than every other color ever. Sokka called desperately as the sleeping bag rocked in the breeze. The blonde stopped and nodded to himself, turning back bending down, picking his staff off the ground and holding it up, the end that Sokka was hanging from rising, and dumped the tribal on solid ground, laughing as Sokka scrambled from the bag and kissed the ground. He looked up to find Sun being joined by Ong and Tai Li, the airbenders laughing, even his sister was giggling at him. What is going on? Sokka shouted, waving his arms furiously. Would you dangle me off of a cliff? And why did you let him? The last question was directed at Katara, her mirth-filled blue eyes peering at him over her hand. Well, you insulted Orange. Sun replied with a shrug, as if that explained everything. And Orange is the best color in the world. Both he and Ong proclaimed, pointing into the air for emphasis. I thought it would be funny, Katara said honestly, with a small shrug. And it's not like you were in any danger. I wouldn't have let them if you were. Sokka gaped at the others in the group, his eyes wide. Any danger? They dangled me over a cliff. Take another look, Ong suggested, waving his hand and bending a small wave of air at Sokka. The tribal warrior gave the young airbender a narrow glare, before turning around and gasping. 
The cliff he had been dangled over was actually a deep ditch, the mist he had seen hiding the fact that he had been held about a foot off of the ground. Did you think I would actually hold you over a cliff? Naruto asked in amusement. Orange is the best color, but I wouldn't put your life in danger just for a prank. Sokka glared at the giggling group. Vengeance will be mine. He swore in a comically serious whisper. His sister shook her head in exasperation. Come on, Mr. Vengeance, breakfast is getting cold, and I made bacon. He immediately perked up at the mention of food, gathering his sleeping bag up and following after the others. How did you make it seem like I was really high up? Sokka asked curiously, after consuming his first plate of food. Well, Katara and Ong worked together to make the mist, to hide the fact that the bottom wasn't that far, Sun explained, holding his cloak over his lap. Tai Li used her airbending to rock your sleeping bag while I held it on my staff. Oh. He focused back on his food. That was pretty good prank. I'm surprised my sister joined in, though. She can be a little he faltered as Katara fixed him with a blank glare over the dying fire. Never mind. You mean boring, right? Tai Li finished for him, sticking her tongue out at the waterbender. She wouldn't let us until Naruto told her exactly what we wanted to do. Sokka nodded in agreement, resuming the activity of stuffing his face. After breakfast had been consumed and the campsite packed, the gang resumed their journey through the air, sailing between the clouds while comfortably sitting in Appa's saddle. Every time they passed within arm's reach of the cloud, Sun would reach out with his cloak in his arms and drag it through the formation, before waterbending the liquid out of it and grunting in frustration every time. What are you doing, Sun? Katara finally asked after watching the cycle continue for more than an hour. He sighed and set the pile of cloth down, leaning on the side of the saddle. I'm trying to wash the dye out of my cloak, but it's too soaked in. The color won't wash out, and pink just doesn't go with my outfit. Sun poked the pink cape with his foot, glancing over at Tai Li. Actually, I have an idea. Why don't you take this, Tai? You need something to fly with, and it is your favorite color. Looking interested, the acrobat crawled across the saddle and sat next to Sun, pulling the cape up to her, holding it up in the air. Ooh, it's the perfect shade. She enthused, hugging the soft cloth to herself, before turning a questioning look on her friend. What about you, though? How will you fly? Sun shrugged, crossing his arms behind his head. We'll just have to stop at a trading village near the water, and I'll buy some sailcloth, then I'll cut it into shape, treat it, and I'll be good to go. He replied easily. Ong, confident Appa could handle the flying, hopped back into the saddle. Why don't we just get you guys some gliders instead? He asked confusedly. I mean, they are the traditional method of flying. True, but do you know how to make more gliders? Sun pointed out. Or where we can find more. A young airbender shook his head regretfully. I don't, sorry. Aw, oh, I really wanted us to fly together. He whined, pouting. Ai Li looked up from securing her new cloak as the blonde bender reached over and patted Ong's shoulder. Don't worry, Ong, we can still fly together, I just need to get another cape and teach Tai Li how to use hers. Sun said comfortingly. Ong perked up, looking at the clouds surrounding them. You know, I didn't know clouds were made out of water. He commented, sticking his hand into a passing formation, pulling it back and finding it covered in cold liquid. Who knew? Just from the way they look, you'd think you would just land in a big, soft cottony heap. Katara added, looking ahead of Appa. Hey what's that? Her question drew the attention of the others, who looked over the saddle, gasping in surprise and dismay. The land below was pleasantly green, with a blue river running through it. But a swath of land had burned, blackened and scarred. The foliage had been scorched away, leaving charred, twisted remains of trees, the river tainted gray with ash. It's like a scar. Sokka noted, his voice somber. Appa slowed and came to land in the middle of the burned area, lone quietly in distress. Tai Li spun slowly, taking in the devastation with wide gray eyes. Who could have done this? She asked in a hushed voice, her slippered feet crunching in the embers. Vitara snorted as Sokka pointed out a set of tracks, the pointed boot print coming from one certain kind of people. Who else burns the world around them without a care? The waterbender questioned rhetorically, shooting the acrobat a narrow glare. Tai Li pulled her cloak tightly around herself, sitting despondently on the burned stump of a tree, her visage miserable. Sun stepped up next to her, wrapping his arm around her comfortingly, while giving Katara a flat look, making her glance away guiltily. Why would anyone do this? How could I let this happen? Ong asked himself, his fingers sifting through the ashes. Sun sighed. Ong, how is this your responsibility? I'm the avatar. I'm supposed to protect nature, beauty don't know how. The young avatar dropped his to the ground. I don't even know how to do my job. As much as you might not like it, Ong, humans are a part of nature, too. And who's to say this was caused by firebenders? The blonde bender pointed out, raising his hand to stall any objections from the water tribals with a stern look. Not every fire is caused by a firebender, you too. 
who's to say this didn't happen because of thunderstorm? Lightning striking dry wood is just as effective as a fireball when it comes to starting a fire. In fact. He stepped up to Sokka, finding the tracks in the ash, following them to the edge of the burned area. Look here. See how smooth the lines are between the burned area and the green? See how fine the ash is right here? Now this was caused by a firebender. Aha! Sokka exclaimed, so this was. I'm not done. Sun cut him off. Did you notice that the fine ash stretches several feet before mixing with the regular ash? That means our firebender, for there was just one, used their firebending to pre-burn the area before the fire spread even farther. If they hadn't, this area would still be blazing right now. He sighed, kneeling to the ground and grabbing a handful of ash from both sides, storing it in a container and putting it in his pocket. It's something that you all need to recognize, and the world, too. He said seriously, turning to look at the gathered group with a serious face. The elements are not inherently evil. You curse the air when a tornado rips a village to shreds with its fury and refuse to breathe. Do you curse the water when a tidal wave smashes a fishing ship to pieces with its might and refuse to drink? Sun ran his hand through the blackened dirt, coming up with a pair of blackened but still hull acorns. Of course not. You mourn the dead, you learn from the experience, and you say, that's just how nature is. An earthquake can create beautiful new mountains or sink a kingdom in a fissure. It creates and destroys, that is simply how nature is. A cycle of life and death. Fire is no different. He stored one of the acorns away, before handing the other to Ong, petting his bald head. You are the avatar, Ong, but you are still human. You can't be responsible for everything. And this and think of it as end, as if the forest won't recover. The grass will shoot through the ash, new trees will spread their leaves to the sun one day. Time heals all wounds. They watched silently as the blonde bender strode away, gently patting the disturbed Appa's head and scratching behind his ears. You know Sokka spoke up, sounding thoughtful. With how fun Sun is, I sometimes forget how serious he can be. The Akatara and Tai Li echoed, their eyes on Sun's back as he comforted the sky bison. Ong gazed at the acorn in his hand, thinking over the lecture they had been given. He's right. He murmured, rubbing his thumb over the smooth shell. This forest will grow back eventually. The waterbender reached out and laid a hand on his shoulder, giving him a warm smile, before turning around after hearing a sound. Walking to them was an old man, wearing rough green clothes and leaning heavily on a walking stick. When I saw the flying bison, I thought it was impossible but those marks he gestured at Ong's head. Are you the avatar, child? Ong tucked the acorn away, nodding firmly. I am. The man nodded in confirmation. I thought so. Please, come with me. My village desperately needs your help. All right, lead on. The group trailed after the man, Sun bringing up the rear with Appa. Sokka slowed down to join the blonde, looking confused. So, Sun, how did you know there was only one firebender? He asked carefully. The Fire Nation armies march in companies three columns across, with tanks in between companies. This a forested area, with the trees close together, not exactly conducive to marching or driving tanks. If the Fire Nation did come up this way, they would have come by boat. Plus, the tracks were made after the fire died down. He shot Sokka an amused look, seeing that the Water Tribe warrior was taking notes. Firebenders may control flames, but they can burn just as easily as anyone else. They wouldn't start a forest fire where they'd be marching through, that would just be stupid. Oh. Sokka muttered, scratching his chin. So overreacted, huh? Inda. Sun replied bluntly. You're going to have to get over your prejudice at some point, you and Katara. Not everyone in the Fire Nation is a bastard. The ones who are though, are usually in charge. The rest are mostly conscripted soldiers who would be whipped, or worse, if they didn't follow orders. Sokka looked up at the sky and thought. Huh. You can be very mature at times. I know. The blonde complained loudly, making the others jump. It sucks. Ailee looked back at them, startled by the sudden noise. What sucks? She asked curiously. Being mature. Sun whined, crossing his arms and pouting. It makes me feel old. I'm only 18. The acrobat giggled at his childish display, though that died down as they approached the village. A large chunk of the wall had been reduced to a Shen rubble, along with more than a few buildings. They strode through the small village, approaching the largest building, where most of the townsfolk were gathered. As the old man approached, a tall man in stately robes walked over to greet them, his eyes looking to the old man in question. This young man is the avatar. He replied, murmurs following in the wake of his statement. So the rumors of your return are true, then. The village leader said, folding his hands and bowing deeply to the group. It is the greatest honor of a lifetime to meet you, Avatar. Ong bowed in reply to the greeting. Nice to meet you, too. What can I help you with? The leader looked away with tired pained visage. I'm not entirely sure. Our village is in a crisis. He's our only hope. The old man stated, turning to the group. 
The last few days, a monster comes at sunset and attacks our village. He is high by, the black and white spirit. Sun's face became understanding, while the others remained confused. Why would this spirit attack you? The chief sighed, moving past them to stare at the setting sun. We don't know. Three nights in a row, he has come and abducted three of our people, dragging them into the forest and disappearing. We grow ever more fearful as the winter solstice approaches. Before they could ask, Sun spoke up. The solstices are the times when the spirit world and the living world nearly occupy the same plane of existence. The lines between the worlds are almost non-existent at that point. He explained. The old man nodded. Exactly. Hybe Eye is already too powerful to fight, and with the spirit world growing stronger, what kind of havoc could he wreak on the solstice? So, what do you need me to do? Ong asked, having an inkling already. Who better to resolve our crisis with a spirit than the bridge between worlds? The chief replied with a question. You are the avatar. Perhaps Hai Bai will listen to you. Right. Ong muttered, not looking confident. Sun put his hand on his shoulder and lead him away with the rest of the group. Listen to me, Ong. Spirits are ancient and powerful, and they know that. Treat them with respect and caution, and never let your guard down. Hai Bai is the forest spirit, normally placid, but if he's been abducting people, something has angered him. He might not be in a listening kind of mood, so be prepared to fight if necessary. He patted the young avatar on the shoulder. Ong sighed, taking a bracing breath. Right. I can do this. He said determinedly. We believe in you, Ong. Katara added encouragingly, smiling serenely. Tai Li nodded in agreement, and Sokka gave him a thumbs up. I believe he waited until Ong turned away to finish his sentence under his breath. We're all going to be eaten by a spirit monster. Sunset approaches, Avatar. The chief said, walking up to them. Will you help us? Ong nodded resolutely. I will. Where does he come from at sunset? The chief pointed at the broken down wall. Over there. Please save us, Avatar. The bald monk slowly strode to the broken wall, facing the trees. As he did that, the villagers and the rest of the group hid in the meeting house, watching Ong through a window. After a few minutes, Sokka frowned. Doesn't feel right, leaving Ong out there to face a monster while we cower. He muttered unhappily. This is a good learning experience. Sun replied, carefully watching Ong. He needs to learn how to deal with spirits at some point, why not now? Still the tribal said, crossing his arms. He shouldn't have to face this alone. But in a few minutes, the sun had fully set. The sun has set. Ong shouted, standing at the gate, his voice wavering with nervousness. Where are you, Hai Bai? Well, I hereby ask you to please leave this village alone. He spun his staff around impressively, planting it in the ground with a firm expression. There was silence, only broken by the faint sound of sun face palming and muttering angrily to himself. Yes that's it, then. The avatar said to himself with a shrug, turning around to head back into the village. He didn't hear the leaves rustle as a massive shape emerged from the forest, almost silently following him into the village. That's not to say that the villagers or the rest of the group were unaware. No, they were very aware. I can say with all certainty that Hai Bai is pissed off. Sun commented mildly, his hand slipping into his pocket to grasp his staff, his eyes on the tall, monstrous form approaching them, aware of someone behind him, quietly wetting themselves in fear and whimpering in terror. Ong finally became aware of something wrong, spinning around to look behind him, his eyes widening in surprise. You must be Hai Bai. He bowed shortly. My name is. He was cut off by a loud angry roar from the creature, blue energy spilling from its razor-filled maw, the power ripping Ong's glider from his hand. It tilted back and bellowed at the sky, raising four of its six arms, releasing another wave of energy, before coming back down and charging into the village. Sun dived through the window, extending his staff to full size, and leaping up to meet Hai Bei head-on, as it charged through one house and decimated the other with a roar. He skipped off of the earth and landed one of the remaining watchtowers, hammering the spirit in the side with his staff. Hai Bei stumbled back, turning its attention to the blonde with a furious growl. He darted forward and Sun leaped away as it smashed the ground, bouncing and hit the spirit in the face, causing it to recoil. My name is Ong. The young avatar called desperately. I just want to help. Please, stop destroying things. Sun spun, deflecting a swipe from Hai Bai with his staff and smacking away a strike from one of the smaller arms. Ong, Hai Bai is enraged. He said, his face and voice calm despite the combat. We'll need to subdue him to get him to listen. I'm just trying to do my job as the bridge between worlds. Ong insisted, landing behind the spirit. Can you please just turn around and talk? Hai Bai ignored the loud little human in favor of trying to crush the bright human, whose weapon caused him no small amount of pain. Irritated at being ignored, Ong shouted. I command you to turn around now. 
Even more annoyed, the giant black and white spirit spun around to face the unprepared avatar, swatting him from the top of the building into a nearby roof. That wasn't respectful at all. Sun called to Ong. Don't try to command a spirit ga. Hai Bai struck at the blonde, forcing him to flip away and extend his staff several feet longer, swinging up and hitting the spirit under the chin, flipping it onto its back with howl of pain. It skittered back to its feet and roared, only to pause in surprise as something small and metal bounced off of its butt. Hey, angry spirit monster, over here. Sokka called, having thrown his boomerang. Not the time, Sokka. Sun shouted. Ong pulled himself to his feet, shaking the dizziness off and looking concerned for Sokka. Sokka, get away from here. Sokka shook his head, determined to hold his ground. We can fight him together, Ong. I don't want to fight. The young airbender replied. I'm just trying to ah. Hai Bai crossed the distance in a flash, one of his small arms snatching Sokka up before turning and dashing into the forest. Ah, crap. The blonde muttered, before calling. Tai Li. Follow us. He paused for a second, wrapping the wind around him and blurring into the forest, leaving a trail of dust that was followed as Tai Li augmented her speed with airbending, and Ong took to the sky on his glider. As they reached the tree line, the acrobat leaped into the boughs, bouncing from branch to branch, following the large black and white form as it slipped through the trunks. Ong. Sokka shouted from the hand holding him. I decided I don't actually want to fight him together. Sun sped up to the spirit as Tai Li hopped above it, Ong pulling ahead. The young airbender swooped in front of Hai Bai, holding his hand out to Sokka as they crossed into the burnt section of the forest. Just as Ong grabbed Sokka's hand, both he and the spirit vanished in a flash of blue light. Unable to stop himself, the avatar hit the ground and rolled to a rough stop at the foot of Stone Bear statue. Sun slid to a stop beside him, kicking up a trail of ash in his wake. Tai Li gracefully landed next to him, looking down worriedly as Ong lay still on the ground. We were too late. She said regretfully, shaking her head. Ong. Are you alright? Sun tilted his head, kneeling next to the avatar and rolling him over. He appeared to sleeping, and Sun touched a finger to his bald head. He's in the spirit world. He revealed, carefully hefting the unconscious body up onto his shoulders, looking around. Spotting a misty blue form standing next to the statue, he pointed at it. He's right there, actually. The planes have become so merged he barely moved when entering. Ai Li looked at the blonde with concern. Err, Naruto. I don't see anything there. Are you sure you're okay? He smiled at her and nodded at the confused spirit form of Ong. I'm sure. Come on, let's head back and tell them what happened. Ong walked alongside them, carrying a representation of his staff. If I'm in the spirit world, how can you see me? Or hear me? He asked. Sun shrugged, jostling the body on his shoulders. I lived in the spirit world for a decade, Ong. The only person more connected to both worlds is you. No one else can see or hear you, though. He explained, before turning to Tai Li. I noticed how fast you were jumping, Tai. Your form is very good. She blushed, smiling happily. Thanks. I felt a little slow, though. I'm not used to the weight of my cape yet. You'll get used to it eventually, don't worry. Besides, it looks good on you. He complimented, making her grin. She stepped closer to him and wrapped her arm around his waist. It does, doesn't it? She said, tugging on the hem of her cloak. It matches my aura so well. I am so confused. Ong muttered to himself, rubbing his head. What am I supposed to do here? Sun shrugged. I don't know, Ong. It'll come to you in time. Just be patient. They walked back through the trees, eventually ending up at the village. Sun. Katara called, running up to them. What happened? Where's Sokka? And why are you carrying Ong? Sun held up a hand to stave off any more questions. First, Hai Bai escaped with Sokka, and Ong is in the spirit world right now, and his body is sleeping. He answered, rubbing Tai Li's back when she frowned. I was there too, by the way. Tai Li interjected, crossing her arms. Katara barely looked at her before going back to Sunday. How do you know? She asked in concern. I lived in the spirit world. He replied, before pointing next to her. And Ong is right there. She looked around, seeing exactly nothing even though walked through the young monk a couple of times. I don't see anything, son. Are you sure? Yup. Now excuse me while I go put Ong's body somewhere safe and buy a sale. He excused himself to go see the leader of the village, leaving the two girls alone. Ai Li frowned at Katara, who looked away from her. What's your problem? She asked directly. Ever since I joined up, you've been treating me like I'm evil. Katara scowled. I don't have a problem, you do. You're the one being confrontational. Oh right, and you're not the one who stares at me suspiciously when you think I'm not looking and watches me like I'm a spy. The acrobat shot back. Is it because you're not the only girl in the group anymore? Or is it because Naruto is paying attention to me now? That's not it at all. 
the waterbender denied heatedly. And his name is Sun. He doesn't care what I call him. Tai Li replied. If it's not that, then what? Is it because I was born in the Fire Nation? Yes. Katara finally admitted, her words bursting forth like a flood. The Fire Nation is evil. They kill and destroy for no reason. They're throwing the world out of balance and you're one of them. Tai Li glared at the panting waterbender in frosty silence. I'm an airbender. She stated with a furious sort of calm, and I may have been born in the Fire Nation, but I'm not evil. Or are you forgetting that Naruto was also born there? The way Katara drew back was evidence enough that she had. The acrobat rolled her eyes and waved Katara off, turning on her heel and striding away with a huff. Whatever, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. And to think, I thought your hair loopies were cute. The waterbender drew herself up in indignation. Oh yeah. Well, you're a ditz. Your aura is hideous. Tai Li shouted back, not turning around. Katara huffed and spun around, marching off in a different direction. Tai Li found Naruto talking to an older woman, holding up a length of thick rough cloth. This is perfect, thanks. He bundled it up and handed her a few gold pieces. By the way, do you have a cauldron I can borrow? Son looked up as he walked, noticing his childhood friend leaning against a nearby building with her arms folded and an unhappy look on her face. Hey Tai Li. What happened? He asked carefully. She pushed off the building and followed him, grumbling to herself. Stupid triple accusing me as if. I'm guessing it has something to do with Katara. He said dryly, finding Appa at a stable and setting the cauldron down. Gathering some wood and bending water into the pot, he lit a fire underneath it with a quick burst of firebending. What happened? Tylee huffed. She said I was evil because I was born in the Fire Nation, and she watches me like I'm a spy, just waiting to catch me doing something wrong. That's because she's suffered by the hands of the Fire Nation. Sun replied easily, using a knife to slice strips of cloth away from the main body. But I wasn't responsible. The acrobat protested. I wasn't around when whatever happened. The blonde nodded, not looking up from his work. I know that. Katara's having a hard time reconciling that not everyone who is Fire Nation is bad, after being told that her entire life. Sokka is dealing with the same thing. The water began to boil as Tai Li sat in silence. Sun poured the contents of a small pouch into the cauldron, stirring it with a stick. I don't like it. She finally said, leaning against his leg. Me neither, but as I said to Ong, just be patient. He turned to the spirit form of the avatar, who was seated next to Appa, looking grumpy. Speaking of which, have you thought of anything, Ong? The avatar huffed. No. He replied tersely. Sun shrugged dumping the cloth in the cauldron. Look up, I think an idea is coming to you. Ong looked up at the sky, frowning at the blue blur among the clouds. What is that? Is it Sokka? He asked. Unless Sokka can fly, then no. The blonde replied, stirring his cauldron and patting Appa's side as the bison sniffed at it curiously. You don't want to drink that, buddy. It smells good, but it tastes terrible, trust me on that. The blue spirit dragon flew from the sky, landing before Ong, who shrieked in surprise. It didn't make any move to attack him, just resting in front of him. Do you know where Sokka is? Ong asked the dragon. It grunted at him, one of its whiskers reaching out and touching his head. Ong's eyes glowed blue for a second, before fading into a look of realization. Oh. You were Avatar Roku's animal guide, like Appa is for me. Is there some way for me to talk to Roku? I need to save my friend, and he might know how. The dragon bent its neck, motioning for Ong to mount it. The young monk did, looking back as the dragon began to ascend. I'll be back soon, son. Take care of my body. Ai Li looked up from the cauldron, feeling like she missed something. Did something just happen to Ong? She asked curiously. Sun began to retrieve strips of cloth from the boiling water. Yup. The spirit of Avatar Roku's dragon picked him up and flew away. He replied easily, kicking dirt over the small fire. I'll take your word for it. The acrobat replied uneasily. Batara stepped around the other side of the stable. Hey, son, can I talk to you about something? She paused upon seeing Tai Li, who huffed and turned away from her. Never mind, I can see you're busy. She bit out, turning on her heel and making to leave. Nah. Sun held up a finger. I'm going to need your help putting my cape together. I also noticed the Tai Li's drags a little, and it needs to be hemmed. Tai Li stood up and turned away. I don't need her help. She replied frostily. The Tara huffed, turning her nose up. Why don't you just burn it to the right length? Sun snapped his fingers, the loud crack echoing through the air, making the girls jump and Appa step back in surprise, lowing at the blonde. Tai Li, take off your damn cape and sit down. Katara, sit down and hem the damn cape. Appa, his voice went from firm to apologetic. Sorry for startling you, buddy. Both girls sat on either side of him, refusing to meet the other's eyes. Katara yanked the pink cape away, pulling her needle and thread out with violent gestures. 
Sun water bent his cape out of the cauldron, setting it on a nearby hook with the strips of cloth, before gathering the hot water into a ball and hurling it over the tree line and into the distance. Here's what's going to happen, girls. He started, bending air from his palms to dry his cape. One is going to say something nice about the other, and the other will say something nice back. Then, once you've both calmed down, we will hash out whatever issues you two have. Neither said a thing, resolutely facing away from each other. After ten minutes, Sun sighed. Katara, your hair is looking lovely today. Ty Lee, your outfit really suits you. He gave them meaningful glances. It's that easy. There was a tense silence, before Ty Lee finally sagged, her shoulders drooping. I really do like your hair loopies. She muttered, looking away. Katara sighed. Thanks. I like your braid. Thanks. Your clothes are really nice. Yours too. Your acrobatics are impressive. I trained really hard, thanks. The waterbending thing is cool. Their bending is pretty cool too. I know, right. Um, I like your cooking. Katara blinked and looked up in surprise, meeting Ty Lee's eyes. Really? Yeah, the acrobat replied with a shrug, smiling sheepishly. I can only really cook sweet stuff, like tarts. Sun shook his head, laughing at an old memory. Only because Mai insisted. He added with a smile. Ty Lee giggled. Yeah, you'd think she was the princess instead of Azula when it came to tarts. I can teach you, if you'd like. The waterbender offered tentatively. I mean, I know how to make stews and soups and things like that. Really, you teach me? The acrobat asked with happy surprise. Of course. Katara insisted. I mean, you're going to be with us for a long time, right? It'll be nice to have someone to help make the meals. Sun gave her an offended look. I know you help, son, but we can't have girl talk. That would be really nice. Ty Lee replied with a smile. I could teach you acupuncture, if you want. That would be really useful, thanks. The two girls smiled at each other, the air clearing up between them. See? Sun asked, gesturing to the two. You two get along just fine. Why is there a problem? The Tara sighed, looking away, dropping her needle and thread in her lap. I don't hate you, Ty Lee, I just me whole life, I've been told the Fire Nation was full of bad people who wanted to burn the world. And then. She slumped on herself, and Ty Lee reached out to touch her shoulder. You don't have to say it if you don't want to. She offered as Sun knelt behind Katara and wrapped an arm around her. No, it's okay. The waterbender replied, taking a deep breath. When I was little, a Fire Nation raiding party hit our home. Thethi took my mom from me. Ty Lee gasped in horror, moving over and hugging Katara with Sun. Why would they do such a thing? She asked in low voice. They were looking for waterbenders. Katara admitted, sniffing sadly. My mom told the leader that she was last one in the South Polish sacrificed herself for me. The two Fire Nation born simply held her quietly, comforting her with their presence. I can see why you don't like us. Ty Lee finally said sadly. I would hate us too, if that happened to me. They sat in quiet contemplation, until the acrobat felt it was appropriate to sure. You know, I have six sisters. She told Katara. The tribal looked up in surprise. Really? That seems like a lot. Tell me about it. She replied dryly. We all look alike, too. A match said. I ran away and joined the circus so that I could be myself, not just one more sister out seven. The Tara sighed, wiping her face. I'm sorry I called you evil. She apologized, looking contrite. I know you're not like the Fire Nation soldiers who took my mother away. I'm sorry I said your aura was hideous. Ty Lee said right back. It's actually a really deep blue color. And I'm sorry I said you were a ditz. Katara replied. The acrobat tilted her head in confusion but I am a ditz. Sun smiled at the two, happy they had made inroads towards friendship. I'm glad you guys are getting along. He said honestly. Stepping away, he pulled what would become his new cloak off the hook, along with the strips. Now, can you help me with this? He settled now softer cloth in his lap. I already cut it to the right length, I just need to fold the edges in and sew the loops in. Sun explained, folding the cloth. What are the loops for? Ty Lee asked curiously. Well, I slip my arms through them and pull the cape taut so that I can fly. Several hours later, the sun had begun to set. It looked like another night of suspense for the village. In the small room in the largest building, Ong's sleeping body sat cross-legged with his glider on his lap. The old man who had led the group there was gently poking the boy, an old woman standing next to him. Are you sure he's not dead? She asked quietly. His chest is moving. The man noted. Ong suddenly stiffened, his eyes snapping open, making the couple stumble back. He stood, stretching his sore muscles and walked out of the building, finding Katara sitting on the steps, looking at the sunset with worry. Um. She called out upon noticing him, giving him a short hug. Where's Sokka? He sighed despondently. I don't know. 
Later, he and Sun waited at the hole, his new white cape flapping in the gentle breeze. As the sun disappeared beyond the horizon, the large monstrous figure of High Bai emerged from the trees, growling with rage. Sun twirled his staff, the golden weapon glinting in the low light, and sprang forward, bobbing under a blow from the spirit, jabbing the tip into its stomach, and rolling away before it could retaliate. Ong conjured a ball of swirling air together, spinning to gather more momentum before sending it rolling along the ground, exploding into a dust cloud under the spirit. Sun dodged out of the cloud, his staff extending as he swung it, knocking the spirit's hind legs up. As it collapsed, the blonde rebounded off of High Bai's shoulders and flipping around to use his staff to sweep the forelegs off the ground, causing the spirit to hit the ground. Landing slightly away from its head, Sun took two steps forward and placed his hand on the beast's forehead, yellow light shining from the point of contact. Now, what has made you so angry, friend? He whispered, his eyes shining like miniature suns. Flashes of memory not his own filled his head, showing a raging fire consuming all in its path. Just before the flames, there stood a feminine figure, pointing her fists at the ground and burning the green away with a concentrated yellow flame. It flashed again, following the dark shrouded woman as she walked through the trees, entering the village through the gate. The memory of implacable rage and a bestial roar echoed through Sun's head. Oh, my friend, Sun whispered sadly. That's not what happened. Here, look. The foreign presence, amazingly large and incomprehensible, brushed against his mind as he pushed his memories of the day before to the forefront, showing High Bai what he had deduced. When the presence withdrew, High Bai bellowed again, this time in agonizing sadness. Sun withdrew his hand, stepping back as Ong joined him. What did you see? The avatar asked in a hushed voice, his eyes on the wailing spirit. He saw the firebender, a woman pre-burning around the fire, and thought that she was the one who started it. He explained sadly. I showed him what I found out, and now he's sad. The trees that were burned down, they were his friends, and innocent people have suffered because of his rage. Ong looked down, his face pensive, wondering what he could do to help. Suddenly, his hand touched something smooth in his pocket, and he pulled the object out, his eyes widening when saw the acorn son had given him earlier. Stepping forward, he spoke up. Hi Bai, you're sad that your home was burned down, when I first saw it, I was sad too. But a friend of mine gave me this, and he said, don't think of it as end, as if the forest won't recover. The grass will shoot through the ash, and new trees will spread their leaves to the sun, one day. Time heals all wounds. Ong presented the acorn to the spirit. His words gave me hope that, one day, the forest will be vibrant and full of life again. Hai Bai studied the proffered nut with interest, slowly reaching out and taking it from Ong. In a subdued flash of light, the monstrous form disappeared, replaced by that of large placid panda bear. It sniffed at them, before turning around and lumbering away, disappearing into a thicket of bamboo trees that grew man-sized in an instant. A murmur of confused voices echoed from the thicket, before the forms of the missing villagers and Sokka emerged from within, looking confused. Sokka. Katara cried out in joy, rushing forward to hug her brother. He blinked in confusion, looking down at his sister. I'm confused, he muttered, scratching his head. What happened? We were kidnapped by a forest spirit and held in the spirit world for 24 hours. She replied. How do you feel? Sokka grimaced, stepping away from Katara. Like I really need to use the bathroom. After the missing villagers finished greeting one another, the leader approached them with a grateful smile. Thank you, avatar and friend. If there is anything we can do to help you on your journey, just ask. Well, we could use some supplies. Sokka replied bluntly. We kind of need food. And maybe money. Sokka. Katara elbowed her brother in embarrassment, her face red. Of course. The leader said happily, waving at a few villagers to go get some supplies for their new heroes. It would be an honor to help. Sun laid a hand on Ong's shoulder. I'm glad you managed to calm High Bai down, Ong. You did a good thing today. The young avatar smiled brightly up at his guide. I had a lot help, Sun. Though, there is something else. Does it have anything to do with what you saw in the spirit world? The blonde asked shrewdly. Ong nodded, his face serious as the others gathered around them. I found a way to talk to Roku's spirit. He announced. Yay. Ty Lee cheered, before grimacing. You. I mean, yay, but also you at the same time. What's the problem? Katara asked, noticing the tension around Ong. It's in a temple on a crescent-shaped island. That island is in the Fire Nation. He proclaimed, to shocked looks from the tribals. The bee continued. Then one more line break. Oh, the temple of the Fire Sages. Sun clarified, nodding his head. That's right on the edge of Fire Nation territory, but it'll be well guarded after our visit to the Southern Air Temple, so we should get going soon. What? Sokka and Katara shouted in disbelief. You actually think he should go? Of course. Sun replied with a nonplussed look. 
He needs to meet with the previous avatar, which is obviously very important. And he's not going alone. Yes, I am. On cut in, still looking serious. It's going to be very dangerous. I don't think I could forgive myself if any of you get hurt. The Taurus stepped up next to him, grabbing his shoulder. Ong, don't go. The world can't afford to lose the Avatar and neither can we. The young monk shook his head. I'm sorry, but I can't let you. Ong, Sun spoke up. I am your guide. Where you go, I go. How can I teach you if you're captured by the Fire Nation? What about Tai Li? You still have airbending you need to teach us. What about Katara? How is she going to get to the North Pole? He pointed at her with a sadly concerned visage. Ong bowed his head in resignation. All right, I'll let you come. He muttered. No need to guilt trip me. Apparently there is. The blonde bender shot back. We're following you, Ong. We kind of signed up for danger. The avatar shook his head, an unbidden smile curling his lips. All right. Then let's get going. He whistled for Appa, glad to not have to go alone, for it was dangerous. The chief approached them, carrying a few parcels of supplies. I couldn't help but overhear that you're going to Crescent Island. He said, handing the pack a gaze over. It's a long flight from here, you should leave immediately if you want to make it by sundown tomorrow. Ong bowed as Apple landed next to him. Thank you for. Oh. The chief insisted, pointing at the sky. Ong jumped up on Appa's head, flicking the reins and calling, yip yip. The sky bison flew into the sky, disappearing into the light of the full moon. Several hours later, Sun awoke from his rest, carefully pulling himself from Tai Li's arms and climbing over the sleeping forms of Katara and Sokka, tapping a sleepy Ong on the shoulder, relieving him of the reins. Ong yawned widely, slipping past him to settle in the saddle, immediately falling into a dreamless sleep. Sun patted Appa's head, running his fingers through the thick fur. You alright, buddy? He asked lowly. We can stop for a while if you need to rest. Appa gave a quiet negative bellow. Alright, just let me know if you get too tired. He replied, making minute adjustments with the reins. For hours, the only sounds he heard was the air rushing through his hair and the nearly inaudible grunts of the sky bison beneath him. As he rode, the sky became lighter as the sun came near the horizon. After a while, he felt a light touch on his shoulder. Turning, he found Tai Li sitting behind him, her visage discomfited. Morning. How do you feel? He asked quietly. Concerned. She replied shortly, wrapping her arms around his torso, leaning her head on his shoulder. I just left the Fire Nation and we're already going back. He let go of the reins to take her hand, interlacing their fingers. We won't be there long, Tai. Naruto whispered softly. Just enough so that Ong can meet Roku, and then we're out of there. Nothing will happen to us. She sighed into his neck, her warm breath washing over her skin. I know, beauty still worry. What if they get their hands on us? It's so frightening, I can't even imagine it. She murmured. It won't happen, Tai Li, I promise. Naruto swore, gripping her hand tightly, turning his head to look her in the eye. You promise? She asked in a low voice, her gray eyes soft. Yes. He said seriously. And you remember what I said about promises, right? Tai Li smiled lightly. That you always keep them. She answered, her empty hand coming up to cup his cheek. I'll hold you to that. She whispered, leaning in as he did, their lips touching in a soft passionate kiss, filled with a promise of safety and the future. They separated and Tai Li put her head on his shoulder, Naruto leaning his head against hers. Even later, the sun had climbed high in the sky, and Ong was back at the reins. Everyone was fully awake and tense as they drew closer to the Fire Nation. Down and behind them, a small Fire Nation ship cut through the water, two figures at the prow. Uncle Iroh was twisting his beard in concern, his face expressing frustration. Sailing into Fire Nation waters off all the foolish things to do, nephew, this overtakes them all. There is no other option, uncle. Zuko replied tersely, his unscarred eye peering through a looking glass, searching through the skies. After a rather interesting conflict with some Earth Kingdom soldiers capturing Uncle, where the two of them overpowered the captors, a search through their bags for intelligence uncovered recent reports, not even two days old, about a town nearby. The town's leader had pleaded with the soldiers to send relief, as they were suffering nightly attacks by some sort of monster spirit. Knowing that the avatar would be drawn by the spiritual conflict, the two royal firebenders traveled to the village, only to find that their quarry had already left. After persuading the leader, they discovered that they had left earlier that night, heading to the temple of the fire sages. What if you're caught? Uncle asked with angered worry. Have you completely forgotten that the fire lord banished you? My father will understand. Zuko replied firmly. I'm chasing the avatar into our home. He'll understand. The older man shook his head in disappointment at his family. Whether it was directed at his nephew or his brother, only he truly knew. I fear you overestimate how understanding my brother can truly be. He murmured sadly. 
Ignoring him, the banished prince searched through the sky, his eyes finding a familiar shape in the cloudless sky. Found you. He whispered to himself, before turning to helm and shouting. Full steam ahead. In the saddle, Sokka looked back, seeing a column of smoke rising behind them. Following it down, he tapped his sister on the shoulder and pointed at the ship gaining on their position. Ong. We've got company. Katara called over her shoulder. And it's gaining on us. Her brother added. Sun slid over to the back, peering over the saddle at the small ship in the water. And they're preparing to fire. He noted, standing up and taking a deep breath. The ball of fire lit up on the deck and was launched through the air. As it screamed towards them, Sun spun his arms in front of him, gathering a ball of swirling air between his hands, releasing it with flick of his wrists. The ball flattened and expanded, spinning like a small tornado and meeting the projectile mid-air. It halted the fireball's momentum and spun it in place, extinguishing the fire before fading, dropping the rock into the sea beneath them. Ili peered over the edge, watching as it splashed into the water. What was that? She asked with wonder. Air shield. Naruto replied quickly, before spinning around as Sokka shouted. Blockade. He called, pointing at the long line of Fire Nation ships in the water. Bong banked Appa, trying to avoid giving the ships an easy shot. This is exactly why I didn't want you guys to come. He yelled through gritted teeth. It's too dangerous, and there's no time to fly around. There's no turning back now. Katara stated firmly. We're with you all the way. Yeah. Let's run this blockade. Sokka shouted. Sun stood behind Ong on the saddle, preparing to defend them. Focus on flying, Ong, I'll keep their shots away. Seconds after he said that, fireballs were launched from the blockade, trailing tails of thick black smoke. Appa weaved through the onslaught, dodging around flaming shots that crackled through the air. One shot was aimed accurately, heading straight towards the sky bison as he swerved in the air. Sun beeped an arm back, his hand open with his fingers curled, a bold bright yellow flame flaring to life in his palm, shooting it at the fireball. A smaller flame penetrated the shot and exploded, clearing it out for Appa. Sun launched more attacks at the nearing shots, blasting them out of the way with precision fireballs. With one final dive, the gang flew over the ships and out of firing range, disappearing into the sky. Woo. Ong cheered, throwing his hands up. We made it. Good job, Appa. Sun sat back down in the saddle, sighing lightly. Well, now we just have to get to the island. Glad we got through that safely. Ili flopped down with him. Me too. How far is it to the temple? She asked Ong. The young monk shrugged, relaxing on Appa's head. I don't know, but it shouldn't be long. He was very wrong, as it turned out. After several more hours of flying, Ong spotted a thick column of smoke rising from the center of Small Island, coming from an active volcano. There it is. He called, waking the others from their short nap. Appa, drooping with exhaustion from flying for nearly an entire day, barely let the riders off before groaning tiredly and falling onto his side, panting heavily. Nice flying, buddy. Sun said to the tired bison, rubbing his exposed belly. Take it easy. Ascending the rough mountainside, furtively glancing around for ambush, the gang made their way to the fire sage's temple, carefully avoiding the small lava flows dotting the surface. It looks like no one's here. Sokka pointed out quietly. Maybe the Fire Nation abandoned it after Roku died. Katara offered hopefully. Ailee pulled her cape around her, her gray eyes constantly darting about. One can only hope. She muttered to herself. The temple itself was surrounded by a low wall that was easily scaled by the gang, and the expansive halls were silent and echoed with their footsteps, giving the place an abandoned atmosphere. That notion immediately died as the gang stepped into the center of the temple, finding the way forward blocked by five elderly men clad in the garb of fire sages. We are the fire sages. The eldest one spoke, stepping forward with a solemn face. Guardians of the Temple of the Avatar. Ong smiled gratefully. Oh, good. I'm the Avatar. He introduced himself. We know. The oldest confirmed, falling into a firebending stance and launching a trio of fireballs at the group. Ong, reacting quickly, spun his staff and created a quick wall of air, deflecting the technique away. I'll hold them off, run. He shouted, ducking low and swing his leg out. A wave of air ripped over the ground, sweeping the legs out from underneath the sages. Sun darted into a hall on the right, the others following him. Every temple has a secret path to the sanctuary, in case of emergencies. He called out, skidding to a stop at sconce. Peering at the base, he found it to have four oval rubies inset into the base, with the leftmost gem sharpened to a point. This way. Stopping every so often, Sun followed the directions given by the gems, leading them down a dead end. Oh, this a really great secret path in case of emergencies. Sokka said sarcastically. Go down a dead end, they'll never suspect that. Sun was inspecting one of the sconces near the dead end when Ong came sliding around the corridor. Guys, what are you doing? This way. 
he shouted before speeding off. A second later, he came back around, followed closely by a fire sage. Never mind. Ong stopped with the rest of the gang, prepared to fight, but not prepared for the sage to bow with his head to the floor. Wait. I don't want to fight you. Yes, because shooting fireballs at someone you don't want to fight is the perfect way to say it. Sun shot back sarcastically. I know why you are here. The sage said, looking up from his position. You wish to speak to Avatar Roku. Ong frowned. I do. I can take you to him. He promised, standing up and grabbing the sconce, twisting it to the side. A small hole in the wall opened up beneath it, and he took deep breath, breathing a short tongue of flame into it. A section of the wall was outlined with fire, before sliding back and revealing a secret door. Please hurry, there isn't much time. Giving the sage suspicious looks, the gang filed into the doorway, the old man following them in and closing the door behind them. Told you there was a secret passage. The blonde bender commented, shooting Sokka a triumphant look. After descending down several steps, the group found themselves at the very bottom of the temple in a wide cavern, walking over black stone with an exposed vein of magma sluggishly flowing to their right. Avatar Roku once called this temple his home. The sage informed them, leading them through the cavern. He formed these secret passages out of the magma. Did you know Roku? Ong asked curiously. The old man chuckled kindly. Oh no, I'm not nearly old enough to have met Avatar Roku in person. My grandfather, however, knew him. Numerous generations of fire sages have guarded this place long before me. We all have a strong spiritual connection to this temple. Is that connection how you knew I was coming? The avatar questioned. A few weeks ago, the statue of avatar Roku did something incredible its eyes began to glow. The sage said with excitement. Sun tapped his chin and thought. Hmm. That was around the same time Ong went into the avatar state at the Southern Air Temple. The sage nodded. At that very moment, we knew you had returned. Wait a second, Sokka interjected. If this is the Avatar's temple, why did you guys attack us? The old man shook his head sadly, sighing in shame. Things have changed. Once, the sages were loyal only to the Avatar. But, after Avatar Roku died, they eagerly awaited the next Avatar but he never came. Ong stopped on the steps, looking down shamefully. They were waiting for me. He mumbled, rubbing the back of his head. They were waiting for me, and I never even knew. They lost hope. The sage continued. And when Sazen began the war, the sages were forced to follow him. I never wanted to serve the Fire Lord, but when I learned you were coming, I knew I had to betray the other sages. Ong bowed slightly to the man. Thank you for helping me, it's your name. The sage looked back over his shoulder, smiling warmly. My name is Shayu, and it is an honor, Avatar. These stairs should lead us directly to the sanctuary. He flicked a switch along the wall, a section of the roof flipping open. Once you are inside, wait for the light to hit Roku's statue, only then will you be able to speak. Shayu gasped in shock upon seeing the closed door. What's wrong? Katara asked, emerging into the room. The gate. It's closed. He proclaimed in shock. The gate was a massive door that took up most of the far wall, with five twisting dragons imposed over the Fire Nation symbol, their heads emerging from the wall and acting as the lock. So? Can't you just open it with fire, like that other door? Sokka asked. Sun spoke before the sage could. No. This door can only be opened by a fully realized avatar or the five sages with five simultaneous fire blaster, in this case, one spiritually powerful master firebender. He answered, his face serious. You? Tylee asked. Wouldn't the sages be spiritually powerful enough? Not in this case, no. The blonde replied dryly. I've been developing a technique that would let me attack multiple people at once, and it should be enough to open these doors except that I've never made five balls of fire at once. He breathed deeply, standing in the center of the room, motioning for the others to stand back. His right hand lit up with yellow fire as he waved it over his head, the flames streaming off to form five orbs in the air, flickering above his head. Concentrating, he brought his hand down to the center of his chest, and then Ong sneezed. Sun glared at the avatar. Can you not? He gritted out. I need to concentrate. Ong smiled sheepishly, rubbing his nose. Sorry. He whispered guiltily. Sun sighed harshly before getting back into his stance, fire springing to life in his hand, as he slowly swung it over his head, the trail forming into five decent-sized fireballs. Bringing his hand down in front of his chest, the blonde bender breathed deeply before pushing forward, streams of fire erupting from the fireballs, channeled into the dragon's mouths. With a loud click and the grinding of gears, the gate slowly swung open, spilling light and smoke into the room. Now's your chance, Avatar. Shai urged, hurry. Ong nodded and quickly dashed into the room, the gate swinging shut behind him. With nothing to do but wait and eventually fight through the sages to leave, the gang leaned on the nearby pillars. So, what's the purpose of that technique? Sokka asked curiously. 
Well, what I wanted to do was create a bunch of powerful fireballs all floating around me, Sun described, using his hands to emulate what he was going for. Then, when they're all formed, I would take little parts of the fireballs and fire them rapidly. He mimed quickly punching the air. But why not just shoot fireballs at them? The water tribe warrior pointed out. It seems simpler that way. Sun shrugged. It is, and that's the problem. I could see it being useful in some situations, but not a whole bunch. I got the idea from watching Earthbenders, one technique has them pulling a shield of loose rock up in front of them, using it as cover, while also shooting pieces out of it to attack. I still have to work out the kinks. He explained, retrieving his staff and setting one end on the floor casually. The gang came to attention as the sound of booted footsteps echoed through the room. Zuko emerged from behind a pillar on the far side of the room, the fading sunlight casting his face in harsh relief. You always were inventive, Naruto. He said calmly, his amber eyes landing on Ty Lee. You even managed to turn Ty Lee traitor. Ty Lee flinched, stepping back from the accusation. I, Ushi stammered, unable to find her voice. How could you do this Ty Lee? Zuko asked, his hands fisting at his sides. You're Azula's friend, and you're betraying the Fire Nation. Unforeseen circumstances, Zuzu. Sun replied dryly. I doubt you would understand. The banished prince nodded, gazing at the sage. You help the Avatar. Why? Behind him, the other fire sages entered the room, gazing at their brother in shock. Shai stood proud. It was once the sage's duty. It is still our duty. A slow, sarcastic clap echoed through the room as a man, dressed in the armor of a Fire Nation admiral, slowly strode into the room, eight firebenders following him. How moving and heartfelt, he said sarcastically, smiling in sadistic pleasure. I might even shed a tear. Zhao. Zuko growled hatefully, stepping away from the man. You're too late. The avatar is already inside the sanctuary. The man shrugged carelessly. He must come out sooner or later, it is of no matter to me exactly when that is. His predatory gaze scanned the room, noting the people in it, his glare finding Zuko and Shai first. My, my. Two traitors, he then tilted his head at Sun, the child spy, and finally turned his attention to Tai Li and the kidnapped airbender. Zuko's head snapped up, swiveling to look at Tai Li in disbelief. Airbender. He whispered in shock. Oh, you didn't know. Zhao asked smugly, looking glad to have something else to hang over Zuko's head. Your little friend there is an airbender, who was kidnapped by a blonde man wearing a white cloak, wielding a golden staff. The admiral's eyes glittered as he looked between Sun and Tai Li. Funny, you don't seem to be held under duress, from my point of view. That's because I'm not. Tai Li declared freely, stepping up next to Sun with her arms crossed. I left on purpose. Zhao shook his head, chuckling quietly. Won't General Ran be glad to get his hands on you? Naruto walked forward into the middle of the room, swinging his staff up from the relaxed position to rest on his shoulder. No one would be getting their hands on us. He rebuked mildly, though his eyes were flashing angrily. Please, the admiral asked condescendingly, do you really think you can fight off all of us at the same time? Even if you put up a struggle, you'll eventually tire. In streams of lightning arced around Sun's body, his eyes beginning to glow with yellow light. And what makes you think you last that long? The blonde asked dangerously, subtly waving at the others to back off. Not that they needed any warning, they had backed up as soon as Sun began to speak. Sun held his empty hand up, the yellow lightning traveling up his arm and coalescing in his palm. Lightning bending. Zhao breathed, and even though his visage showed anxiety, his body language spoke of excitement. The blonde crushed the ball in his hand, the lightning sinking into his body and his glowing with light. Sun flourished his staff as an aura of electricity emanated from his body, releasing a fearsome shout before charging at the gathered firebenders so fast that he left behind bright split-second silhouettes of himself imprinted in the air. He blurred through the armored figures, the crackling of lightning, metallic thuds with impacts on flesh and grunts of pain and exertion, singing through the air as Sun beat them down at lightning speed. Zuko, wanting to take advantage of the distraction provided by his friend, snuck around the room and approached the tribals from behind, intending to take at least one of them hostage. If I can grab one, the avatar will try to get them back, and I can lay a trap. He was intercepted by Tai Li, who jumped in front of him with a determined face. Don't get in the way Tai Li. He shouted, throwing a weak stream of fire at her, not wanting to hurt her, just move her. To his surprise, the normally cheerful acrobat frowned and took a stance, forming a thin ball of air in front of her, before throwing it in front of her, extinguishing the flames. I won't let you hurt my friends, Zuko. She stated firmly, darting forward, under his swing and rapidly tapping three areas on his chest. Zuko stumbled back at the sudden feeling of pressure inside of his body, his arms falling limp. What? He gasped, looking up at her in shock. What did you do to me? 
Hai Li didn't answer verbally, throwing her hand out and bending air at Zuko, sending him crashing into one of the pillars. Sun stopped in front of Zhao, the other firebenders and sages lying unconscious on the ground around him. Zhao glanced at the bodies, his shaking eyes and sweaty face betraying his fear. No one threatens my friends. The blonde whispered menacingly, before jabbing the admiral in the side of the head with his staff, knocking him out. Panting lightly, Sun wiped his face with his arm, turning as the sanctuary doors swung open. Smoke and light poured forth, but instead of Ong stepping out, it was the ghostly form of Avatar Roku, tall and stately with his neat white hair and tailored robes. It seems we meet once again, young guardian. He greeted the blonde with a small smile. Sun bowed deeply, surprising the others. Avatar Roku. He said respectfully. Now, now, what did I tell you to call me? The ghost asked with an amused shake of his head. Rampero. Sun answered with no small amount of embarrassment. There you go. The dead Avatar said. Now, I am going to sink this temple in the island's volcano. Leaving now would be wise. Not without Ong. Katara immediately protested, even as Shayu tugged on her arm. Turning to the sage, Roku nodded thankfully. Thank you for leading Ong here, Shai. The elderly sage bowed deeply. I am honored to serve the Avatar. Roku nodded, his eyes beginning to glow. With the raising of his hands, the island began to shake and the floor cracked, the angry red of magma shining from below. The shaking roused the firebenders, and Zuko took the chance to escape, his arms mostly immobile. But the flick of his wrist, Roku shattered the wall closest to the gang, as the firebenders evacuated and Temple began to sink into the overflowing lava. With a small nod to the blonde, the smoke around the former avatar was pulled in, hiding his form from sight. A second later, it dispelled, revealing a tired on. Quickly hefting the young monk onto his shoulders, Sun led the others out of the temple, shortly cresting the hill of the island. He let out a sharp whistle, calling for Appa. Ong recovered from his exertions a few seconds later, as the sky bison swooped down to land nearby. You should come with us, Shai. He said to the elderly sage. But the smile, the old firebender shook his head. A journey as harrowing as yours, young Avatar, is not for an old man such as myself. I would only be a hindrance. However, I foresaw the day I would have to betray my fellows, and I prepared accordingly. He clasped his hands in Fire Nation style and bowed deeply. It has been an honor, but here is where we must part. The gang bowed back, and Ong waved goodbye. Thanks for the help. Good luck. He called as they clambered onto Appa. But the flick of the reins and yip yip. The sky bison took to the air, flying away from the erupting volcano. As they relaxed in the saddle, Sun turned to Ong. So, what did you learn from Roku? He asked curiously. Ong blanched quietly, looking away. I'd rather not talk about it right now. He muttered, hanging his head. The blonde arched an eyebrow, but acquiesced. You'll have to tell us sometime, but I won't pry. He kicked back, resting his head on his arms. Sokka glanced at the blonde, his expression confused. Grandpa Ro. He asked in disbelief. Sun immediately blushed. He wanted me to call him that, okay. He liked giving people nicknames. The Tara shared a devious smile with Ty Lee. What nickname did he give you? She asked. The blonde bender pulled his hood over his face, hiding the embarrassment he felt. Sunbeam. He finally admitted in a small voice. The others rolled in the saddle, laughing loudly. Ty Lee draped herself over Sun's stomach, giggling helplessly. Sunbeam. She gasped in mirth. It's so cute. I was eight. He protested, his lips curling even through his embarrassment. The Tara, clutching her stomach, managed to get out, whatever you say Sunbeam. And then fell over in paroxysms of laughter. Sun sighed and shook his head, but joined them in laughing a second later. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.